welcome listeners to Kyle and Cody's Cult Cinema Cast. I am Kyle. And I'm Cody. And welcome to our fourth part of the sub theme, I think. Uh yeah. Le- yeah. Officially, yeah. It's something. It's something. Yeah. I think we got one more after this. And then I guess the finale, and that's just how those worked. But uh yeah, really excited for that. Um episode. 17 that's so we're pretty well almost the way through the series just gonna do some i think uh, we got like a few more scheduled things and just some random stuff because i changed the schedule pretty soon after but uh yeah we're doing uh this week we're doing the 1984 dune movie which is now not the only dune movie since there's a new dune movie which uh wasn't very good well i got it I- I gotta say, you you kind of did your uh, oh, did yourself for this one because you you went in and you did like all the research that you possibly could, and by that I mean I'm pretty sure you watched you watched this Dune movie, you watched I'm assuming the new Dune movie, mm-hmm. and then I think you also said that you watched the uh, the TV series. Yeah, I watched the three episode sci fi mini series. Uh, also, like a shit ton of like. Uh lore videos um if it, shout out to the guy like the guy because i got mo- a lot of it from him uh the guy does quinn's video quinn's ideas is the name of the channel he does good dune content because mm-hmm. he i just want to shout him out i don't know I, I don't know how many subs he has but he, he does a lot of the good dune content uh there's a good chunk of that that's like uh reaction to like the new dune movie but he does good other stuff too but yeah, no, I didn't. Yeah, I, sure. I went. I yeah, I think I proclaimed once Cody made up his mind about what we were doing. It was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna watch all the Dune and become as much of an expert as I could <laughs> in like the course of a week. Which uh, I didn't. Well, I mean, apart from going out of your way to read the novel, I'm I I, I wouldn't have had time. I'm a, I'm a slow reader. I'm also I, a very slow reader. Yeah, um, no, I'm. I got like 15 chapters of 40 left in the book for the finale. I'm going to try to finish it up uh, in February. I I think I'm going to do what I can. But yeah, so I didn't read the book for this, but I did like a lot of understanding and like research from people who have read the shit out of the book. So I Mm -hmm. and I got like a summary of the Dune Messiah, which is the sequel. And got like some information on that. I didn't get around to re- getting a summary of uh, Children of Dune, but uh, we're not gonna go too far in that anyway. But yeah, so yeah, that's what we're doing this week. Uh, next week we're gonna do, or next uh, next episode will be True Romance, which uh, I have no idea what we're in for there. I've only seen like one clip. Cody, you'll know what. <laughs> clip of the reason for me picking that movie when we watch it uh i think he'll know where my mind was at when he gets to the point of the movie but uh it, it should be interesting anyway and then i think uh, uh yeah. i don't even know what movie you're talking about it's so it's a uh, chance that i have no clue it i i'm just gonna look it up just to make sure i got it right but it's uh <laughs> it, well no i i like i think i know who the yeah, it's a 1993 film written by Quentin Tarantino, but not directed by him. So, okay, yeah, yeah. So it's it's uh, yeah, some t- a little bit of early Tarantino stuff that's uh, going to be kind of interesting. And then we'll do the Wicker Man remake after that, and that'll be February. And then March is kind of uh, wild card stuff for a little bit. But yeah, Dune 1984. Dune 1984. I have to say Dune 1984 now because there's two Dune movies. Which, sure. I understand people like the new movie. I didn't care for it. And you didn't either? Uh, I'm, I, 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 okay. So when I first initially watched the Dune movie, you got to understand, I'm coming from a place of like very little to no understanding of what uh dune is supposed to be yeah like what it's oh me too uh <laughs> where the potential lies for um all this accolades that uh people ha- have given it 
um i was speaking to my brother who like adamantly was like no dude was like a really good movie and i'm like what <laughs> and he's like yeah and i'm like was it though <laughs> so like when when i initially decided to uh put this on the sub theme i was kind of i was in a weird place where i wanted to i wanted to tackle the question of like was the new dune movie a good movie but like I don't know where Dune is supposed to be heading, and so I thought maybe if we did the 1984 version, it might uh, mm -hmm. help clarify some of the yeah. the uh, hangups I had with the initial Dune movie. But like, <laughs> I gotta say, it didn't it no. didn't make me feel any better. Like this is it feels like low foot hanging fruit here for the podcast. Yeah, uh, like if if you if you don't mind like some ps1 era cgi uh the sci-fi miniseries is a good bet okay yeah no like if if you can look past the cgi although the cgi and the dune were on the worms is uh kind of good uh, they're kind of i i'm almost almost my favorite worms i'd say in, in, in I, that, the miniseries yeah. yeah they're kind of um or in this one oh in in the miniseries i kind of like them best because because I mean, the worms in this are pretty decent. Oh yeah, They're done by I do you believe uh, the team of Ridley Scott who did the uh, alien design. So like, okay, so all the worms are good. Like none of the worms mm -hmm. look bad in any of the movies. I would say, um, like that's debatable, obviously. But I I think all the do like if like as far as like if I if I would uh, like clarify this the best way. Um, as far as the model, I like the Dune miniseries. As far as cinematography, I'd say the worms in Dune 84 are best, uh, best sh shot in some aspects. Mm -hmm. The Dune, the new one, I kind of like it. It's a little too minimalist for me, personally, but uh, they do kind of cool, and but I do think like the the shot in this where we see the sandworm uh like eat that trawler is like the best out of any of the movies I've seen. Of like any of the worm instances. Like okay, so uh giant sandworms have kind of like uh made their way into science fiction almost as as much as like any other science fiction trope. I mean uh there's this, there's Tremors, there's, uh, um, Star Wars, they had, uh, uh, the Moonworm. I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it had a name. Like, it like it's not important. How, like, how do you think these hold up in the term of science fiction? Like, not just within itself, um, in the movie Dunes. How do you think these, uh, CGI sandworms held up? Compared to other CGI sandworms that have... Uh... I think these worms are practical, actually. What do you mean by practical? Practical effect. I think they're models. Uh, oh, that's there, There's some better. CGI used. Um, like, when they're oh, riding... Yeah. the Like, um, when, like, uh, Paul has to hitch a ride on one later in the movie, that's CGI. Because that's, like, the, the close-up shots are CGI. The larger shots, I think, are largely uh, practical effects. Mm-hmm. That's but, even yeah. better. Yeah, but yeah, I'd give I'd give the mini series a shot if you want to see like most of the Dune story with like I think they add a subplot with the princess, which works on its own. It doesn't really gel with uh, what you see later in the uh, Dune like novel series, based on what I know. But uh, it, it it's a pretty good mini series. I like it if you're able to look past the CGI. And I quite enjoyed it. When was it made? I forget. It's 2000s miniseries. Uh, Frank Herbert's Dune is what it's officially called. Uh, 2000. Okay, so that's not even that long ago. Yeah, no, I guess there's like a 20 year gap between the uh, adaptations, actually. Sort of. With some given... Well, I mean, gap. arguably, like, two, early 2000s CGI is notoriously bad. Yeah, I don't know. Like, yeah, are you yeah. saying this is this is worse than like 2000 CGI or no? Um, or it's like okay. on par for 
like it's TV. It's early 2000s TV CGI, even though it's like premium oh. stuff uh, like this would it would do quite well. Like th- like there's a whole thing um, if you're like if you know uh, this helps jumpstart a bunch of stuff that like leads to the uh, Battlestar Galactica reboot, which looks really good. But like it's OK on it's it's not uh like the CGI is pretty bad, but it's if you can ignore it, it's it's a good story anyway. The plot's there, mm-hmm. yeah, which is what's important at the end of the day. But yeah, it's like it, they're hour and a half episodes. Um, I watched the, there. You can find them on YouTube, but uh, they're censored, which isn't like a big deal. They're just yeah, you, yeah. It's just they're censored and like badly. Oh, that is absolutely hilarious. Okay, so I was scrolling through the Wikipedia page, and I was looking for uh, adaptations to see if I could find the like the secondary uh, miniseries after the fact, but apparently that's in its own category. They were looking for uh, mostly game adaptations, um, which Hasbro Games picked up a board game, but eventually I do believe that there, there was a comic book series based around the movie Dune, and it was edited by Ralph Macchio, and if anybody knows the name Ralph Macchio, he played the villain in The Karate Kid. And so I was like, wait, Ralph Macchio got into writing comic books? So I clicked his name, and apparently there's a re- uh, an editor named Ralph Macchio, which is spelled exactly like the Karate Kid um, character. <laughs> and it, it it's written on his Wikipedia page. Machio is not related to the actor Ralph Machio, but his nickname Karate Kid <laughs> because of the actor. So, I mean, apparently there's two Ralph Machios. One who's an editor for Marvel Comics and one who's uh, the bad guy in the Karate I think Kid. I've actually so, heard the I heard about the editor, maybe. Um, I've watched enough comic book stuff that I've definitely heard it somewhere. I just couldn't put it, place it. Mm-hmm. But... Yeah, um, base, yeah, the 1984 Dune film based off the 1965 novel by Frank Herbert, which had five sequel novels, uh, would have had another one, but, uh, Frank Herbert passed away before he did a seventh. Uh, I don't know if anyone completed that. Uh, but yeah, this movie was, uh, made in 1984, or made for 1984, it's 137 minutes long, which is two hours, 17 minutes for those of you who can't do math, uh, which no one can. Uh, Sorry, two hours, 27 minutes. Wait, no, no, I was right the first time. I can't do uh, math. Okay, either. but so I think I watched one of the director's cuts. Uh, yeah, there's a couple cuts. Uh, I think there's also like a fan edit. Okay, so mine was two hours and 57 minutes. Yeah, th- I, I, I think you watched like a fan edit, which is fine. <laughs> Uh, I might just miss some stuff. Um, <laughs> there, yeah. So about the cuts of this film, there's like an extended uh, television cut, which uh, David Lynch mm-hmm. has uh, like disowned. Which is it was isn't the three hour cut. It's a bit. It's like in between. I think it's like another ten minutes. Um, David Lynch is the director of this, by the way. Uh, pretty early in his, di- it's like his third feature length film it's yeah it's it's a it's what he calls his studio film and i don't think he's really comfortable making like epic sci-fi uh, which is fine i'm not besmirching the guy it's just like it's he, he like he said like oh yeah it wasn't my cup of tea and uh he's like refused to like go back and do a director's cut i think he's been offered to do it but he he's never done it and he has no interest in it and he also like didn't make the final cut of the film either that's another thing um ultimately like uh i don't know if he yeah sci-fi does not seem to be up his alley he no. seems to be mostly like a like, okay, so arguably at the beginning of his career, he made uh, Eraserhead in 1977, um, surrealist film. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next thing that he followed up with was a historical drama piece called The Elephant Man, 
the end. His third movie was Dune, which he directed and wrote for. He'd eventually make Twin Peaks. And did none of the el- editing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um. He he he's like like but, people but love even him. with that like tw- Twin Peaks. Twin Peaks is notoriously is that not like a mystery guy that he says here uh mystery horror so and it's a television series yeah he's like david lynch like you could see it work like i think it'd be like like if he made like a science fiction thing it would be more like something like cronenberg would make like if he were to do it of his own volition but this is what he was like asked to do as part of like a three picture deal and it's just not suited to him uh he's tried but his honestly his the david lynch lynchisms in this film don't really serve uh to make the film better it's just not it, like this just isn't his cup of tea he's not like um the kind of guy who likes this sort of genre not to say like he like the sci- sci-fi people also like david lynch it's not like a these guy these he's he could be perceived as like adjacent like like people like him but it's just not a he's not a sci-fi guy at the end of the day and that's not um he actually turned down the opportunity to make uh he was asked to do star wars 3 i guess 6 return of the jedi but uh yeah he was offered that turned it down because of course he did yeah budget of 40 mil 40 to 42 million dollars um box office was between 30 and 37 mil uh, 38 million uh so yeah this didn't make its money back perhaps only barely if you're being very generous but uh even then it again we've talked about this you need to double your budget so you know he would have needed 80 million dollars uh so yeah he couldn't really pull that off music's done by the band toto which is weird um they do an all right job that's interesting um stings in the movie yes and uh the the previous like somebody named jordofsky i do believe i'm pronouncing that correctly i'm going off of memory here uh he wanted to have pink floyd come in and do the soundtrack yeah i think at the point in time that he was doing it i think that would have been a better take for at least music in this um series but also like this guy was kind of uh low-key batshit crazy and it's a very good thing that it didn't get made because like i think i think he was uh promising way too much to uh actors he would have liked to see it seen on the screen i think he he was uh he said to uh salvador ali i do believe dolly uh, <laughs> uh painter yep dolly dolly yep. yeah he promised him a hundred thousand dollars for every hour of screen time he was in which i mean arguably it probably wouldn't have added up to very much if he just cut him down to like a minor part or whatever but like and then i think he had a couple of other weird requests and stuff like that but like yeah i don't think it ever got to uh cody is referring to a 1974 attempt i think to make the dune movie uh with yuridovsky there's a whole documentary about it um that about how it never got made I think some cryptocurrency nut jobs just figured they'd made they got had the rights to it. I think that was a recent um controversy where a bunch of cryptocurrency dipshits uh spent like twenty million euros on like an art book and thought it gave them the rights to Dune. Uh or at least Dorodovsky's Dune cut. He's uh we should maybe maybe we'll do a film of his at some point. Uh but I hear his films are quite good. And it would have been very nutty and like, uh, yeah, part of the reason it was shut down is because the budget just uh, got out of control and they were like, eh, no, we're not doing this. We're not paying you to do this. So that's why that never happened. Uh, best to my understanding, I didn't really get around to looking it up, but I know that documentary is on Shutter actually. So it also would have been like a 
supposedly would have been like a bigger departure from what happened in the book. So, yeah, that is what it is. I felt like we just left the thing about how we didn't like the new Dune movie up in the air. And like some people are screaming at us. Maybe we talk about why we didn't like the new Dune movie. Uh, you first. Sure. But, but, but before we actually get into that, I wanted uh, I want to briefly cover a plot synopsis. And I want to do this as briefly as possible because this movie is hella long. So why don't we just go in and like... Oh, do the... Yeah, do the... At least, yeah. Yeah, no, no, I, I hear your point. You make a valid point. Uh, yeah, so... um, Yeah, June 1984. We open with... And actually, I don't mind this scene. It's from... It's based actually based on the book. This character in the book, Princess U- Urulan who's uh, barely in this movie. She's here, and she does some voice hour- uh, overs throughout the movie, but she's not seen again until the very end of the movie, so it's weird. It's why they made like a whole subplot about her in the miniseries um, that wasn't in the book, so it's, uh, it's very... Yeah, she's just in this for uh, expla- like explaining some of the backstory, um, because the Dune novel is a lot of it's told from some of it's told from her point of view i think like each chapter is headed with like a quote from her about paul uh the main character paul's life and yeah she's a bit of a narrator and about like the premises she wrote uh in the future about the life of uh the character paul atreides she we get like a the shot's bad but i like the intro actually like, it just shows her face staring at the camera, reciting some lines, which I wish they had done something else. Maybe, like, hide who she is, so we're not, uh, she's maybe just a faceless uh, narrator. And then she shows up at the end of the movie, re- re-recognize her voice, and I'm like, oh, so she's uh, the person that told this story, and she's, like, the point of, she's a bit of a point of view character. And that would actually would have been interesting. But, uh, no, we see her face right from the beginning. So yeah, she is, uh, she tells us it's the year 10191. Uh, it's actually, I think I read something. Uh, this is actually like the year 14,000 our time or something like that. Um, because 10,000 is counted from the point at which they learn to do faster than life travel. Uh, not from, uh, the alleged birth of Jesus Christ. So. Actually, not even from. That's always weird. That's always weirded me out that the new year doesn't start. Why didn't they just have the uh, like Christmas be the new year? Like that's my big question about how the calendar works. What do you mean by uh, this? Like, oh, um, okay. So, like, you know how we have Christmas and then New Year six days later? Why don't they just? Um, sure. Why don't they? And you know how um, the year uh, AD is the year of our Lord. <laughs> So, uh, translated from Latin or whatever, or Greek, and, uh, like, it's meant to be, like, it's been 2,022 years since the birth of Jesus Christ, is how that's supposed to be denoted. Why don't, like, they just make the new year on where the birth of the Christ child is, so that the year, so that, um the years of our Lord actually starts when the Lord is born. Like, this is something I've never understood. I think, I think ultimately that boils down to time is an illusion and, uh, calendars make absolutely no fucking sense. Yeah, exactly. They could have just, I, I, I'm just saying shift the whole thing over six days and it makes a lot more sense. Also, we give, uh, religion way too much credence nowadays. Like, I love the fact that, like, I know I know there's, like, an alternative form um, nowadays to uh, what BC and AD stand for, but, like, <laughs> like, like, for the longest time, we, we've always used the, the uh, BC acronym of before Christ and uh, AD of after death, and, like, well, no, it's it's like I don't know how recently that's actually been changed. It's not after death. It's like Anno Dominico or whatever, uh, which translates to Greek as uh, the year of our Lord. 
so it's yeah it's not after death because that would make the um ad like after death would be uh 33 ad like it's meant to oh? like yeah the the year of our lord that's what i'm saying the year of our lord starts when the lord is allegedly born so <laughs> that's why there's none of this makes sense <laughs> yeah no no like i'm just saying shift the entire thing over even less days. sense yeah what the fuck uh, per back six days or forward six days uh like essentially in my version um the christ uh, like christmas is december 31st and uh like d- and, so it's yeah. new year's yeah it would be new year's eve essentially but like n- notoriously even at that like year you're talking about christmas yeah like okay, okay but do you- <laughs> You do realize that Jesus Christ was not born on Christmas. Oh right? yeah, no, 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 no. I know, I know that. Um, but <laughs> like, <laughs> so like, like, no. In actuality, the time shift would would be like tw- twenty seven days into like, uh, like in June, I do believe. Yeah, no, no. That's uh, like obviously, like they've. I'm saying like at least tie it to like the celebration like like that's a whole other thing about like jesus not actually being born in december he was probably born in like may or whatever but that's beside my point actually like they could also start the new year in may i don't care i think think what what kyle is trying to say is that he he hates new years uh no i'm just saying it should be they should have combined like if it's gonna be the year of our lord they should combine it like other cultures do that sort of thing just combine the two just have them be the same day that's because like it's supposed to be like the transitionary period of like of all of time according to the calendars and yeah no it's so it don't make much sense anyway (laughs) once again (laughs) this conversation is is wildly off topic (laughs) is way too well violently off topic and like it's so abstract the way that we we decide this type of thing. So, like, I, I think, like, 365 calendar days is normally what we classify as a year. But, like, I, I don't believe that's the only calendar that's, like, worth mentioning. Like, I think there's other forms of calendars that other people use yeah, that are just true. as valid true. or not necessarily just as valid, but, like just as abstract as anything else we use to classify a full calendar year i guess like uh yeah uh, like the mayan cal- calendar was notoriously like what we used was it not no we like yeah i mean it was used by the, every like it used to be like way back in the day everyone had their own calendar i think like a lot of people places still have their own calendar it's just like white people forced everyone to use ours because we were in charge for a little bit or we said we uh, were in charge white like, people. yeah no <laughs> we were i hate to say it kyle but white people are literally the worst and like no argument honestly <laughs> <laughs> i also made a mistake actually it's uh twenty thousand years in the- okay it's use it's uh twenty thousand years in the future because uh they move from ad to uh what they call the U at universal standard uh so it's uh it's 10,191 US uh is the technical calendar date of all this also like like we understand perceived time based on like early histories of the world like so fucked if i know like one one year aliens are gonna come down and be like yeah we've known about earth for the last like six trillion years which is gonna blow our fucking mind because like we've only recorded history for so long like we don't know prior to anything maybe we're uh earth as we know it has been a a dying planet that's all of a sudden had life breathe back into it is it's just an example of like uh how alien existence could interact with yeah us in modern days and just completely um i mean we don't really have yeah. time to talk about aliens you because understand what i'm I mean, saying they understand yeah, it yeah okay. 
Yeah. No, I mean, there's no We're aliens. Still talking in about aliens, yeah. arguably. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah. I mean, though, though there's no like <laughs> aliens in Dune, sort of. Like, they have animals that are alien animals. They don't have like intelligent alien beings in Dune, alleged so far. <laughs> That's, yeah. Okay, but they, they arguably do, but I, I don't think they ever address it. They've had a, a couple of, uh, uh, little people on the in the show, and they're never like, "Oh yeah, they're dwarfs or anything." They just never acknowledge it. Like, well, it's David Lynch. He's, dwarf, it, I mean, it's David Lynch. I think he's using like it to shock the audience. I, I think it's David Lynch. He's, I think he's using it to shock the audience. He's not like I think there's stuff we could get down to about like how David Lynch treats treats the uh, different different uh, body people, but. Uh, I don't know enough about David Lynch to, to say that's like a problem he has consistently. That seems like he might be a problem he has consistently. We'll, I, I don't know. We'll have to watch some more David Lynch at some point and see. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, also, yeah, like all the crazy creatures in this that are uh, intelligent, like that speak, are uh, like either some form of mutated human at the end of the day. So there's no mm -hmm. like alien. A alien intelligence in dune and that was frank herbert's intention but uh yeah we'll get into the we'll get uh moving back in because i've explained nothing about the film so far <laughs> so yeah we open yeah we get her, uh princess Uruland's exposition uh opening monologue which i thought was good and i kind of liked and then they did another opening exposition monologue from the point of view of the uh of the shipping guild is what they call it a uh, really basic name, which I kind of like. I like basic sci-fi names. Actually, I, I have a, I enjoy them. That's how I like the name things, but uh, the shipping guild, they're the guys that control all the faster and life travel in the Dune universe. Uh, and they're a bunch of fucking weirdos. I feel like that's uh, a fair point. Lots of people in this are weird to be fair. This is a very weird 1960s based book. <laughs> I'm just like, Kip, the one thing that I actually really enjoyed here is uh, the, the uh, um, still picture shots. Yeah, no, and they do they do do nice like uh, kind of effect where they show off uh, like, oh yeah, here's uh, they point out like the four planets where the movie shot uh, movie is the story of the movie is set. Um, it's not terribly necessary, but this is a nice looking page and make a cool poster. I could have that on my wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely a poster at some point. Uh, yeah, it points out that there's uh, Arrakis, which is the place where all the spice comes from, which is the sci-fi thing that makes space travel possible by essentially uh, making these things called navigators so fucking high that they can comprehend the ability <laughs> to uh, space travel and like bend space safely and accurately. Um, so it's like the reverse of like alcohol where it's like you become like super good at driving. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it, it's like how they used to portray like really, really old hippies and they're like, uh, drugs will like show you the way to enlightenment and stuff like that. And like, apparently this uh, spice actually works where, yeah. uh, you somehow not only can perceive space and time, but I, I, do you believe it also gives you eternal life? <laughs> uh, it doubles your lifespan, uh, according to the book. It's uh, it allows yeah. you to <laughs> fold space and time, and use telepathy. I do believe at some point in the film. Um. Okay. So the effects of the spice <laughs> within the uh, Dune universe are that it like it's a psycho, uh, psychologic psychedelic. That like can uh, double your lifespan and like expand your mind, which is allows them to do like uh, advanced calculations beyond the minds of normal human uh, capabilities. Uh, it is also somewhat addictive. Some people will die if they quit taking it. It's refined in a bunch of different ways, uh, and like people take it in different amounts. And basically, what all the uh, I think everyone needs a little bit of spice to operate uh, and people have that manifest in different ways. The uh, navig the shipping guild uses it to navigate. 
Uh, there's a guy, there's guys called Mentats, which are uh, like human computers, essentially. They're like uh, meant to be like really smart and like operate like a machine uh, mentally. Um, there's the Bene Gesserit, which are like a bunch of uh, space witches, uh, which can do a, <laughs> like um, psychic suggestion, uh, a, bit, a bit of mind control, and also like small scale teleportation. Uh, it's implied in this movie that they can also do telepathy, but that's not in the book and not in some of the other uh, movies. But uh, yeah, so it's pretty... Yeah, that's and there's other things. The Fremen are like the... the okay, not native peoples to Arrakis, but might as well be. Um, they navigate... They ended up taking up residence there thousands of years ago. And they've been living there ever since. And uh, since Arrakis is the place where all the spice come from, they've been so thoroughly concentrated in it that uh, their eyes start glowing blue. Um, except in the new 2022 movie, which uh, doesn't have their eyes glow blue and uh, just mutes the effect so it's not as cool. <laughs> uh, just a little on this because I've had uh, a couple of things to say. This this originally was shot in Mexico. Yep. So air pollution made contact lenses to make blue eyes kind of uh, obsolete. Like it wasn't possible. Uh one of the screen directors, I don't know, or special effects artist, was trying her hand at uh, a way to use dye to turn the eyes blue, which resulted in her going blind for two days. <laughs> and so they had no good way to make, like, one of the distinguishing feature of the... Uh, Fremen. You just said the word. Yeah, Fremen. Uh, Fremen. <laughs> Uh, Fremen uh, possible so I was looking at this guy and I'm like wasn't this guy supposed to have blue eyes and then like two minutes later it showed him with blue eyes and I'm like but like what <laughs> so there was no yeah uh, Paul eventually gets them after being in the desert for several years and that's the explanation because he's just like been you're in the desert you're just surrounded by spice and it just soaks in the uh... So eventually you just get these glowing blue eyes in the cool versions of the movie. I actually, it's, it's done. Been, yeah. like also, it's done in post in this, in the mini series. And I think it actually looks real is my point. End sure. Of day. End of the day. Go ahead though. I, I was going to ask you, uh, do, we've used this archetype. Uh, I don't know how often we've talked about it, but, uh, white savior movies. Mm. Do you think this falls into that category? Yes or no? Okay, interesting question. I just watched a thing about this earlier. Uh, um, okay, so sort of. Though, um, mm -hmm. okay, so here's the thing about Dune in general. It resembles a lot of things from sure. traditional fantasy archetypes, but is not uh, like approving of them. This movie's not good for this. But if you move into like uh especially like the mini series, you'll get a better idea you'll get a better uh grasp of this. Um I believe they're heading toward it in the uh the new ones, but we'll see. They got more of those coming out later. The author Frank Herbert's intention is that uh one of his central theses for this storytelling is that charismatic leaders should come with uh, this is an exact uh, pretty well exact quote charismatic leaders should come with a warning label that says may be bad for your health so you're supposed to be very skeptical of paul atreides in this so yeah he does do a lot of stuff that uh like you would have that would happen in a white savior movie but you are supposed to be skeptical of it just based on like what you're uh, given the subtext of the work already. So sort of, but he is like demanding you to be skeptical of it. Uh, not like a lot of other, which actually makes him pretty like advanced, but before uh, in comparison to a lot of uh, 60s sci-fi, but yeah, no. Uh, so yeah, it's there, but you're supposed to be skeptical of it anyway. 
So I think that kind of like that it's the opinion of mm-hmm. a lot of, of the experts that uh, it sort of uh, cancels it out because yeah, like um, the 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 the, ent- the accusation comes from is uh, the white savior is a character who goes into a marginalized, usually a white actor, but you can do it like with other people. But uh, it's a, it's the white char- main character going in with a marginalized tribal or less sophisticated or whatever word you want to use, which is probably inaccurate giving like a uh, history and whatnot. And they go into this less quote unquote, less sophisticated society and use their skills to bring up that lesser, uh, lesser society and leads them to victory. Now in the, in the text of the book, the movies and books, it's a little like he Paul requires a lot of mostly like requires a lot of like learning from these people, which on its own doesn't disqualify him fix, fitting the trope, but because he eventually does lead these people to prominence, which does appear that way. But it's pointed out in like uh, the series that, yeah, this is actually kind of a bad thing that he's doing. And like eventually results in a lot of bad things because essentially what he does is he's like just changing leadership in the already oppressive uh, structures of the government as and not like uh, creating better social change. And just in general, uh, Frank Herbert thinks that we should be skeptical of all charismatic leader types. So, yeah, Mm -hmm. I see what he's saying. And uh when I uh, originally watched uh, uh, the newer Dune, I was watching it very much so. Uh, looking at it through, first of all, as an indigenous person, uh, and seeing kind of like colonial mm-hmm. undertones within it, where uh, the freemen are essentially, first of all, like shunned into the the mm-hmm. outer side of society in their own on their own planet and on top of that like uh i want to say like it would uh, be technically an oligarchy correct yeah that's a word for it it's uh the governments in dune are a noble like a based around nobility it's run by an emperor and uh run by dukes and barons so it's very uh, archaic and old-fashioned given the time which is different than a lot of other uh sci-fi series but yeah it's um yeah it's this very yeah it is a very european style like medieval european style government when you get down to it yes and like i get yeah and i get where you're i get where you're especially like just watching the uh the 2021 one because that only tells you half the fucking book or like a third of the fucking book. yeah definitely like, like it doesn't include like the endings and like Especially like, like okay, yeah. so I think it yeah. ultimately, yeah. ultimately, to put this in the most blunt uh, of ways possible, uh, I think I think between uh, watching the the older version, the at the time the newer version ended, I still had two two hours on the older version. Yeah, and like this version is also um i again the 2021 story the the story made by the 2021 dune is not finished so i cannot say this for sure they they're gonna start Mm -hmm. filming dune the second part of dune in uh july is my understanding but this one is out of all the three adaptations i think i can safely say that this one is the most white saviory of any of them because like if there's one of them that's like the least critical of paul atreides it's this one like especially given the ending sure and and then like a lot of the stuff that um if you read the next especially your view of paul changes especially if you get even when you get into the next book uh dune messiah where it's like oh yeah uh this jihad jihadi starts kills millions and not billions of people so like that makes you see him very differently and that's just not in like as much in the uh original like the first book 
um it's hinted at and like if you read like you can definitely get that inference uh reading the book or doing the uh mini series and maybe doing the 2021 show we'll see uh when it's all done and said and done but uh yeah i think this one is the most uh white saviory of the adaptations but like there's stuff that i don't believe it should be entirely uh dismissed as a criticism i don't believe it's like um uh, especially compared to like the worst of worst offenders this is like coming at this from the point of you should be skeptical of what paul is doing so that's not a total write off of what you're uh, of what's being said and like people have said it but i think this is it's something you're supposed to be like naturally critical of i think like frank if you said to frank herbert uh like if you were still alive it's like hey is what he's is is paul kind of using like take like using the uh fremen for selfish reasons he would probably say yeah yeah he is yeah that's probably a fair he'd probably nod and like yeah that's true i don't think he would uh I don't think Frank Herbert would get like super defensive if you brought up those points, uh, especially if you did it like uh, tactfully, whatnot. Uh, although he's passed away, I don't know. I don't want to speak for him too badly. Anyway, uh, our next, yeah, we get the scene from the Spacers Guild or the uh, the Guild, the Shippers Shipping Guild. Uh, we're God, we're not far in the movie. Although the movie takes a long time to get the get like. I'm only doing slightly worse than the movie. I've all I have definitely imparted more information than the movie at this point. I'll say that. I do actually keep a I keep a tally of like how long about exposition where I feel like I took a point of like keeping track of like okay, how much this movie is like mostly exposition until at least 40 some minutes in in my opinion. Yeah. In the uh to uh two hour 16 minute cut so yeah they're the in the shipping guy the shipping guild guy doing his uh speech is says oh yeah we're gonna go talk to the emperor and uh get him to kill this guy paul which is uh this is a big problem with the opening of this movie they just i thought the 2021 one was bad for just telling you everything but uh this one just like does it so much worse like this just tells you everything like there is no twist in this movie that mm -hmm. you not just like spoil for you in the exposition it's like oh yeah paul's a big deal uh you need to get rid of him because he's gonna cause big trouble for you later in the movie where it's like oh yeah this is subtext and the, the emperor just like uh the spite the spacer guild and this is an attempt to like portray that the spacer guild the shipping guild has like power over the emperor which was something that's done subtly in other places but here they just got to like blunt force that message into their heads because david lynch doesn't know how to write sci-fi and also isn't comfortable with writing sci-fi like uh, one of his quotes about this is like I was just making decisions based on like what I thought the studio would want. And the studios famously want with these type of movies is like to beat you over the head with stuff. And so he films scenes that beat you over the head with stuff. Here, here's what I have to say in my defense to this. They were handing out glossaries in movie theaters to try and explain just how convoluted the plot of Dune is. Right? Yep. So so you have this, like... <laughs> you are in a situation where you have no... For people who've never watched or picked up the book Dune to come into the movie theater, you're trying to... You have to sell that, right? True. I just... I would say this does a bad job of that, still. <laughs> uh, like, people still found this film impenetrable. In a two-hour-long movie, though. Yeah, True. But um, I think. What do you mean impenetrable? I, well, yeah, people don't. Uh, people like came into just this. Uh, like we both come into this watching some earlier Dune content, but uh, yeah, the, like people that like watched this fresh and like didn't have any knowledge were like totally lost. Famously, uh, critics hate this movie. Hate this movie in mm -hmm. 1994. They still hate it. I I I pretty well hate it. 
Um, I don't like it very much. That's why we're doing this instead of the 2021 one. Like, I didn't like that movie, but this one's way worse, despite like some of the good qualities of it. Yeah, it's uh, the shipping like the shipping guild has like noted some stuff happening and it's just like, hey, Emperor, what's up? So the Emperor just tells us what the rest of the plot of the movie is. Uh, so there's no mystery. Uh, the Emperor just says, oh, yeah, um, I'm like setting up like House Atreides to fail by setting them up on uh, Arrakis and like encouraging this little uh, interfamily conflict between House Atreides and House Harkonnet, who are mostly the villains of the movies. And I'm hoping that uh, House Atreides will destroy because they're getting too powerful and I hate them, which by which he means, and this is the subtext I always take to the movie, to this uh, plot, is the House Atreides is too good at its job, so I need to get the, get rid of them before people start saying that, hey, maybe the competent guy should be emperor. Like, that is shockingly common yeah. in this sort of system. Uh, this is how Rome fell. Like, this, like d d the story yeah, of Dune, basically. yeah, the story of Dune has been compared to uh, explanations about how Rome fell. Uh, because a lot of the later era Rome, especially Imperial Rome, was like, oh yeah, this guy is getting competent. We got to kill him before he uh, can like claim he'd be the better emperor. So that's a problem with like Imperial Roman politics. Also, you could just kill the last guy and become in charge. That's probably just a bad thing to happen. I think that's just like the shot in the back of the head of your political system as far as I'm concerned. I mean, like, notoriously, like, uh, I don't fully, I get, I get the fact that, like, okay, well, like, they killed off House Atreides and they put, like, Lord Harkin in power on, on the planet instead of just being like, why don't we just put Lord Harkin in the planet? Once again, I I think this uh, falls deeply under under the fact that I have no clue of the political backstory of fucking uh, Lord Atreides in this film. Basically, the gist of it is like what you need is like, oh yeah, um, the background is like, oh yeah, the House Atreides and House Harkonnen hate each other, and uh, House Atreides is rising in popularity. So the emperor wants to get rid of him because then he could make a run for the throne. They don't need to say like, oh, he's afraid of them. It's like, oh yeah, we need to like, uh, House of Trades is becoming big for their britches. So we need to like put them down before they uh, make a run for the empire. Okay. So yeah. like, it's like, it's like a really, uh, uh, let's, let's bomb China before China eventually bombs us or North Korea, I guess um, would be a better uh, definition of that. Like, uh, it'd be, Oh, uh, <laughs> it'd be more like, um, if you like to use like a modern term, it'd be more like if, uh, um, Al Gore was to kill president, uh, like president Bush when he was like governor of Texas or whatever, like that sort of thing. It's like going at a pop and mm -hmm. like going after a popular uh, politician who's going to who could like make a presidential run. It'd be the same thing. Granted, that's a I'm not saying that any of this is easy, but I'm just saying they do a bad job, which is part of my job here to critique. But what, what I'm saying is uh, there's there's definitely like a line of succession in this movie. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. Essentially, yeah, um, essentially, um, Princess Uruland would become the next empress is, yeah, I don't think, uh, so, so yeah. the only way that House Atreides would actually be able to ever get into power is if, if, if they were capable of overthrowing the, the current government. Yeah, which there's within some, the, yeah. Within the movie, and they'd have to do that by, by force or, like, through skeevy, like, political means. Which there's some implication that that's not out of the question because um, I don't know if it's said in this. I think it is actually, but like a, a lot of the time it's saying that like, oh yeah, um, House Atreides troops are like getting really good at their jobs and could perhaps challenge the uh, Imperial uh, Sardaukar forces and that they're starting to get really good at their jobs. So that's like I think it's like implied in some versions of this at least that it's it's plausible that like House Atreides can make maybe make a run at it. 
I, I actually think I, I remember uh, reading that somewhere. Yeah. Uh, or not reading that somewhere. I think it, it's better defined in the, the newer film while the older film, it kind of just, like, I watched this kind of hides that. Fact. I've watched um, the story yes. four times uh, or three, four times in the last week. I'm I get them mixed up a little bit, uh, to be fair. But yeah, so yeah, the emperor tells the spacers guild or the shipping guild. I get those mixed up. It's so easy to do about like his whole plan. Uh, this navigate uh, we get exposed to uh, a navigator which is a big mutant in this who's like on four legs and is like swimming around a tank and is like entirely unnecessary to the normal plot. Like he is not seen at all in the, uh, I don't think he's seen at all in the 2021 movie or one of these isn't seen at all in the 2021 movie and is not seen and is only briefly seen in the miniseries and doesn't even, isn't even a speaking character in that. The shipping guild doesn't isn't a speaking character at all in the miniseries. They appear once at the very end. It's just they're just mentioned a lot. And the shipping guild wants them to kill Paul, which is randomly included in order to spoil the rest of the movie. Um, and like there's no reason for any of this. Um, this entire interaction between the navigator and the emperor are is like entirely manufactured just to spoil the rest of the plot this is a problem with this movie it's like so much of it is just like backstory and like extra bullshit that just ruins the rest of the film and yet none of it explains the themes of the film which is what like the 2021's intro film's intro just spat out what the message of the film was at the beginning which is debatably better because that's not necessarily shown in the uh, text of the in like the text of the film, but this is just like spitting lore at us for forty minutes. So yeah, that's a thing. We're introduced to uh, the Emperor's truth sayer, who is uh, a the leading figure of the Bene Gesserit, uh, which is led by people called Reverend Mothers. And is like an organization of these uh, psychic women uh, that are, I guess, for whatever reason, women are more able to uh, gain these powers, although occasionally men can gain them. But when they are tested um, using a thing called a pain box, all the men tend to die, um, especially in later challenges that give you more power, men are more likely to die in those two. So it's not that it's impossible for men to learn these powers. It's just that it's really, really hard to get good at them. So yeah. And then we get some in, we get to see, meet our main character, Paul Atreides, who's watching some informational stuff on house Harkonnen, uh, which is very bluntly put. They add in the point that, uh, he wants to steal the Duke's signet ring, the Duke of Hesitrade's signal ring, which is a uh, signet ring, which is incredibly irrelevant. Like, it's just like something they've added to the movie for like no reason. It's just dumb. Uh, he, uh, he gets some information on Arrakis and he is met by his three tutors or three of his tutors, Gurney, y uh, Dr. Yui, and uh Lifso. Lifto? What's his name? Uh I have it written down. It's on a different page. Uh Duncan Idaho. No, the other one. No, the no. Eyebrow no. one. Idaho comes later. No, eyebrow guy. What's eyebrow guy? I know who you're talking about, but like honestly I didn't pay attention yeah, no, to really, uh I can find uh, it here. His name. So Thufir. Yeah, Thufir is the third one. Sure. Uh, he's the least important. That guy. Yeah, he's the least important of any of them. I think he's even cut out of some versions yeah, of the movie. I would argue that they get, all of these guys are, like, not important at all. Yeah, Gurney's um, sort of relevant. Like, he's he's around for the whole movie. Um, he does stuff that's kind of cool. He's paid by... Uh, Gurney's played by Patrick Stewart. So, that's pretty awesome. Um, and it's like fucking 
barbarian of Patrick Stewart. It's like his angriest and like grouchiest version of himself. Like this is okay. In perspective, this is a 1984 Patrick Stewart. Yep. Which like arguably, I don't know how how much older he was in Star Trek. Like the Star Trek's late eighties, so it's this is pre Star Trek yet. But uh, he's yeah, this is pre Star. This is pre TNG Patrick Stewart, and he is awesome in this. I love him so much. He's just like a really grouchy guy who gets into a knife fight with uh uh Paul, who's like two third, like half his like two thirds his age or one third his age, and they just like matches them and like you believe it because he's fucking John McPicard. I don't I don't think you had to, I don't. <clears throat> you don't notoriously get this as much here though because of the CGI for yeah bullshit they got going on. Yeah, the shields are done perhaps the worst in this of any of them. The sh- uh the to practice knife fights, they have these things called shields and they use them for other stuff too. It's regular used in the movie. They just can't use them in uh certain circumstances, but uh it's essentially it blocks things that are fast moving objects. So if you like try to stab somebody, it'll bounce off. But if you move slowly inward, uh, that'll kill someone. And like these, uh, one of the fact, uh, like key features of this movie is the knife fighting, uh, or of the Dune franchise is knife fighting. Because uh, in the backstory of Dune, there was like a four, like a hundred year long assassination war between all the like noble houses, and you can tell, like these people are like prepared to like fight off people who ambush them in the middle of the night night in close quarters and like they're all trained in like night dual knife fighting and like gritty like assassination it's pretty cool it's kind of cool just not necessarily in the flashy star warsy sort of way it's, it's kind of i kind of like it but it's yeah these the shield is really blocky it's very uh very very early cgi I think Tron's 1981, mm-hmm. and, and uh, uh, that's the second film with CGI in it. Narrowly beat by a uh, quick scene in Star Trek: The Wrath of Khan, which is a fun movie. We should watch, maybe we should do Tron next season. I kind of want to do Tron next season. I want to watch Tron. We'll talk about this later. But uh, yeah, um, there's also a fourth tutor named Duncan Idaho. Who's uh I he's really kind he's got a cool name and he's played by he's Jason Momoa in the new one. Keep like so this is one of the biggest problems that I've had uh notoriously with this uh uh film. Cause when I was watching this, um uh Patrick Stewart's character uh in the t- 2021 version is actually played by uh Josh Brolin. Uh, Duncan Idaho is played by Jason Momoa. Um, this one, uh, he's not s- so recognizable. Like it's not a, it's probably a big name for the time, but it's like, it's not that good. And and the problem that I have with it, yeah, he's from Logan's Run. That's what he's he was in. Both in both of these, is they kill off all their star power, like really early on. Duncan Idaho dies. And I was like, oh, Jason Momoa is in this. Oh, this should be a good movie. And then, like, 20 minutes later, they're like, yeah, and he's dead. And then I was like, oh, wait, isn't that Josh Brolin? And I was like, oh, Josh Brolin, awesome. Like, at least it's something that I can attach, like, a a face and a yep. name to, right? Like, and they kill him off, too. And then they did the same thing in, in this film where they showed us... Uh, uh, Patrick Stewart, and I'm like, oh, Patrick Stewart's in this one, and then they're like, and you don't see Patrick Stewart for the next uh, 50 minutes, and basically he gets a couple of uh, cameos at the end there, essentially. They pick they pick him up again right before, like, as they're, like, at the beginning of the third act, uh, which is 20 mm-hmm. minutes long in this movie. But the, the point that I'm trying to make is, like, if Jason Momoa was, was alive in the movie, it would have made the movie a lot more interesting. Yeah. I don't think Timothy Chal- Chalamet 
has what it takes to carry this film. Yeah. Trilogy. I mean, okay, to or be fair. A prequel at the, or sequel to this point. Okay, to be fair, like we're we're about, we're about a couple of straight men saying we don't we're not like letting Timothy Charlem Charlemagne uh carry the movies. But uh I think like the female audience will largely accept that. To be fair, this is kind of on us. <laughs> like like the the the, the ladies like Timmy Charlemagne like quite a bit. Sure, but uh, like okay, but like I'd also like to point out that it, it's not only Timothy Charlemagne at this point in time. It, it also goes back to the 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 guy who plays Paul in this movie. Yeah. Uh this movie it was his first ever acting job. Once again, it, it all boils down to like a lot of what I would call uh, main character syndrome, where you've taken this bland kind of everyday guy and you tried to make him like thrust him into the point of uh, like a story, but like he's not that interesting. And like the only thing that he really has going for him is the fact that he he kind of sort of has mind control powers. Yeah, no, he, like, I absolutely acknowledge that about, it. like, that is a complaint you can absolutely have. And, like, I don't know how you do it better, but, like, Paul Atreides is just good at everything. He's the literal chosen one. I think he's, like, mm -hmm. he's like, oh, yeah, I am Paul Atreides. I am the Chishop Shatterach and Mahdib the chosen one of like three different civilizations and uh my my kid is going to grow up and become the god emperor of the universe and <laughs> like he he's like I am the best at knife fighting uh I don't need to knife fight people because I am the best at knife fighting after the first 10 minutes of the movie uh and <laughs> Like he, like after he gets dumped in the desert, he just starts getting like a huge amount of power creep, and he's like super good at everything, which is an absolute valid critique of the franchise. But I, we're yeah, to the point that like there, there's no, there's no fallout for this character. You've set up this character to be like the end all be all of this whole entire franchise, and I'm sorry, but like. That doesn't make me feel something for the character. No, yeah, the payoff for, like, the moral of the story is, like, technically in the next book where Paul kill where Paul gets, like, trillions of people killed. It's, like, that's the point. It's, like, yeah, he's a charismatic leader and, like, you can, you, even, the, even then, even if you think you can count on him, he's gonna get a lot of people killed. Like, he's... Like, this is, like, that's the point of the movie. The franchise is, like, you can't trust the people in power ever, no matter who they are. Which is true, and it's just an interesting... It's just, like, it's not necessarily the best, uh, like, catharsis experience, which it's not. So, even there, yeah. You know, but, but, like, even with uh, also like Paul's just the blindest name ever. I fucking hate the fact that this character's name is Paul. Uh, if you're named Paul, I don't know what to fucking tell you at this <laughs> point in time. My dude's like, I hate your parents. Just <laughs> do it. Like it's fair. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm my name's Cody, so I really, I really, <laughs> really can't be talking too much shit about the Pauls of the world. But uh, any what I, what I'm saying is like. Regardless of how, like, prominent this character is supposed to be, like, it, it's, <laughs> I don't know The only thing it. that I think, the only thing that I think saves it is, like, yeah, he's good at everything, but you're not supposed to root for him, which is kind of, like, antithetical to a lot of storytelling techniques, which is fine, yeah, like, the, it's a good, it, it's a good point, but it's, yeah, it's weird. But my point be being is, are you saying that as somebody who's watched or listened to what, like, is this too much of an inside joke is what I'm trying to ask you. And Quite possibly. Is, like, the fact that Paul is good at everything something that you pick up as a reader, or is it something that, like, you've learned through, uh, rather interviews with uh what's it, like the writer or something like it's it's not i mean 
he it's portrayed in the text that he's good at everything. He's just like, I think, yeah, it's literally said later in the movie. I'm like, I am better at knife fighting than everyone in this squad of like uh, 2000 actors. <laughs> I, I am, I am the best among you. I am the best at everything. It's basically stated in the text to be fair. Yeah. I also hate the fact that everything in this, in the, in this, uh, in this movie seems to be solved with a fucking knife fight. Um, I kind of like it. In, in my opinion, it's a very... It, yeah, but like, that's, like, such a weird... I mean, okay, like, like it makes sense as, like, the sense it's of, not like... like uh, it, it's a sword fight or anything. Like, at least the sword fight's at least a little more climactic. Like, like what you gotta understand that, like, knife fights are very, very close contact and also just it doesn't translate to the screen as much as possible. And I don't fully fucking understand what is going through. Maybe not the directors, like the thing at this point, but like the writers at that point, like was he like fucking sword fights are way too mainstream. We need to, we need to go back to the days and like, like fist fights. Like, so I got like three points here. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I, I just want to say like, okay, sure. t- uh, on, on like one net angle, like these, like this movie has the worst uh, knife fights of any of the adaptations, like the knife fights in the miniseries and in the new one are way better. I, I so far prefer the knife fights in the, uh, like miniseries. Second of all, I think the point, uh, the reason they do knife fights and not sword fights uh, or whatever is cause like like I said, the backstory of Dune is like, these are people that are like, like every one of these uh, noble characters is like an expert in like not getting killed by some assassin. Like that is what every talent these guys have is based upon is like, okay, someone is going to try to poison my water. I need to be able to survive poisoning water. Uh, Someone sneaks out in the, someone's going to try to sneak out in the middle of the night. I need to be able to like, jump out of my bed sneak a knife out of from underneath my pillow and fight some guy who tried to kill me while i was half asleep that sort of shit is what like these guys are like based on so it's um a skill they've based based on this uh history they have of like fighting off assassination attempts which is probably the best clarified in the books probably because you can just say like yeah i was trained to do this because i my family has to fight off assassins and it's not portrayed the best in this. <laughs> it's another thing in like the mini series where you spend like a half hour of the mo- the, sh- the first episode being like, oh yeah, we need to like find uh, people trying to assassinate us. And it's like, oh yeah, we're gonna search this place for traps and like assassins and whatnot. It- it's not it's not like a formal duel. It's like, oh, we need to get really good at knife fights, and we've like sort of formalized it. I said three, but that was two, and I don't have a third. Like arguably. It- here here's my counter argument to that whole thing is like wouldn't well first of all you already you always have uh a body shield on you from my understanding right not always and also it doesn't like protect you from like slow moving stuff so like you could wear one during your sleep but that just means they can like slowly get up to you so they're not perfect and uh they don't wear them all the time i think uh okay so so my other argument is like, how do you win a knife fight? Uh, like being very fucking good at knife fights and never absolutely getting hit. Like they are, ter- it is famously like very lethal. Like knife fights are famous for like one guy dying and then the other guy dying in the hospital. <laughs> so famously, like notoriously, like uh, you win a knife fight by bringing a gun to a knife fight. Yeah. Like all, <laughs> my other argument though is like a sword is like a big knife. And like you have <laughs> you have a longer reach because you have a sword over somebody who has a knife. I think like, the only yeah. good thing about a knife is, is it's concealable. And that kind of makes sense. But like why are you making that the end all be all like decision maker of like how you run politics at this point in time? It's like, oh, whoever I wish I wish that's how we dealt with politics nowadays. It's like, yeah, whoever can beat the opponent in a knife fight will become the prime minister of 
uh, Canada. I mean, at that like, point, you just hire guys to beat other guys in night fights, and that's how the Roman Repo- uh, Roman Empire fell. <laughs> uh, anyway, that, that's actually my third point, is that, like, I think knife fights are kind of cool, and we need, like, a, uh, this is the knife fight franchise, I think. This is, everyone else can have swords, and I, also, I think that's actually my third point, is that swords would make these guys look co- too cool, and they're not supposed to be cool. I think you're, and like, this is kind of, like, stripping bare the pretense that, like, nobles are noble. Yeah, but, like, uh, as you said before, like, the House of Atreides is, uh, <laughs> has shown to be like have the best fighters but only in very specific circumstances well technically no they don't they have the second best fighters which is why they need to be killed by the best fighters uh and like very underhandedly at that best knife fighters though yeah 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 that is demonstrated to be fair yeah no one beats the house of Trades guy in a knife fight in this yeah anyway so that's he's in yeah so there's the knife fight we're also demonstrated a thing that is added for the movie which is the weirding modules which is like a gun that where you say words and it makes things explode uh it's pretty dumb i don't like it so what you're saying to me is that we're okay so this isn't in in like the no yeah isn't gonna happen in the 2021 version which is good because like the way that i saw it at this point in time uh like, one of two things, okay? The people who are going to rule have to have the best knife fighters and the best people who can yell at, at their guns the loudest. Yeah. That's, like, how power was decided in this universe. Yeah, no, this is, like, extended from something in the book called The Weirding Way, which is a thing that the Benny Gesserit have that... uh Paul's mother, who is a Bene Gesserit, has taught him how to do. And the weirding way is like uh, small scale teleportation, which is never demonstrated, which is like in totally impossible, like tell through any of the movies. It's never done well where like I, I actually did look it up where it's just like, oh, yeah, someone explain to me what the fucking weirding way is. I don't know what it is after watching this movie three times. And yeah, no, it's it's short range teleportation is what the weirding way is. But uh, it's extended in this movie into being like a House of Trades thing that lets them have guns that uh, make sound explode. Sure. Yeah. That yeah. checks out. Yeah. No, it's it like there's a few things that like bug me about like the Dune franchise and like no, that it's strange that like there there's one other thing I'm going to talk about that like none of the adaptations have done properly and it pisses me off. And that's one of them. Like, one of these movies should have been able to explain to me what the weirding way was. Um, and it's because, um, and this is something I learned, like, from my writer's group, because I tried it in, like, something I was writing. Don't make your magic powers invisible in your writing, future writers, because it's really impossible for people to understand what they are. Like, I learned I, I learned this by talking to, like, my writer's group. And I'm like, yeah, that actually makes sense. I'm being too, like, subtle about this. Like, it's really cool. Like, it sounds really cool, but it's not uh, easily penetrable by the audience. Anyway, yeah, we get that set up with Paul. Also in the six, yeah, also in the 60s, people thought we were actually going to get psychic powers at some point. That was just a thing they thought back then, sort of, like a lot of people. You'd be surprised. Yeah, I don't know where that, like, that whole like weird subgenre because like uh Cronenberg was notoriously for like uh writing about like uh people acquiring telepathic like telepathic abilities he was operating heavily back in there yeah it's also in like Star Trek where like if you watch the original series and TNG there's just like guys that have psychic powers like that's just a thing that's kind of took mm-hmm. it for granted and like Yes, in the future, we will all have psychic, psychic powers, and that is just a thing that we assumed in the 1960s. It's something we eventually grew out of as, like... Yeah, uh, and it's, like... <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> it's, like, the, the... the Well, I mean, also, like, notoriously, uh, Stephen King was one of the bad yeah. uh, proponents to that, because, like, he, he... Nowadays, he's still harping on about, like... Uh, kids being abducted because they show late in like i think that was uh one of oh, his geez. uh newer yeah. books was about a kid who was abducted because he had latent uh psychic abilities but anyways uh 
like it'd be really interesting to try and trace that back to like the origin of it um and kind of the chicken and egg effect of that whole entire best i can check is best i can gather is uh there was a, like an old uh, it, americans got obsessed with it because uh some soviet street i don't want to call her a street magician but she like did the moving things with her mind street tricks and these are things you can look it up how to do one online uh but like some soviet lady did it and then that convinced the cia that they needed to figure out how to do it if the soviets know how to do it so there was like a very brief period where like they were convinced uh that this could be done and like the cia did a bunch of like put it act like the actual cia put like actual money into like trying to get people to demonstrate psychic powers and for a few years they kind of convinced some people that they did um this and eventually like mm-hmm. james randy comes about and starts debunking these people and uh that's kind of the downfall of that after a while because like there are still people to think it but like enough people have like oh yeah we've documented how these people do these things and yeah were there there was the weird um uh mk ultra link to it yep. correct uh it's that's a slightly Where different they're like, thing. Uh, well, we're gonna we're gonna feed feed these people so much LSD that they potentially have psychic abilities. Different like, thing, kind of but uh, similar. yeah, different thing. But that's kind of adjacent to what we're talking yeah. about here. There's some adjacency here. there, but it's not it's not technical. Anyway, we're moving on because yeah, that's just uh, the best <laughs> I got. Um, uh, uh, and to like go outside and like grab a cigarette and just like mentally hype myself up for the next i don't know 40 to 50 minutes of plot for this movie because like <laughs> we're moving on we're moving at like a slightly i'd actually still say a better pace than the movie because <laughs> the movie is paced terrible well, like let me tell you if you if you need to like wake up at all like just walk outside in this minus 30 <laughs> fucking Saskatchewan weather no. <laughs> that is it'll, it'll definitely fair. get you where you need to go <laughs> i have I, I i have been opening dugout all day so uh that's a thing um you've been what opening the dugout for the cows so they can drink water oh that's awful yeah um yeah it's like with an axe and like the whole sort of uh the first time I did it, I had, I have to go into the water because the coal's kind of like freezing. Oh, you're freezing. breaking the ice. Yeah. Well, uh, breaking a little bit of ice. Like, we drill a oh, hole. Oh, that's even worse. Yeah, we drill the hole, and then, like, uh-huh. we expand it out from there with an axe. But I uh, the hole was sort of freezing shut, so I had to, like, take the axe really deep in there. So, the, like, water splashed all over my glasses, like, freezing a layer of ice over my glasses. So I couldn't see out of them. And then mm-hmm. I, that was the first uh, my first driving out to the dugout. Then I went to go lure the cows out, and I got stuck, and I needed to dig myself out, which actually wasn't as hard as opening the dugout. But uh, one of the neighbors did see me like from the road and tried to and was gonna try to help me out, but I ended up getting out before they could get out, get out, get out and see me. So, mm-hmm. which is funny because like uh, you're definitely what I would call like a really established farmer out there, but like. Are they like we have two horses out on my brother's farm and they just notoriously will eat the snow. Oh yeah, they I don't know they how will. many cows you got, but I'm assuming it's a lot a, a lot more than uh they can two horses. um <laughs> it's just better that they drink water usually. Mm-hmm. Cuz uh like the water will be uh it's less cold, so it's I think better at dry yeah. temperature, so it's better for them to drink water. Although the water is uh mm-hmm. quite cold. Like, it is, like, below a foot of ice most of the time. So, that's that's how you cool your drink. Put it below, a uh, like, a foot of ice and just, like, open up a hole in it so it, like, springs to the surface. <laughs> that's how you get cold water. Well, like, even notoriously, like, uh, we were sitting here at, like, uh, minus 40 and we were heading out to, uh, I'd say, like, a Christmas party, but it was more of a, like, Christmas gathering and I had, uh, like lukewarm dr pepper because i bought it in the store and i bought one of the big packs and they don't freeze those um and so yeah it's like minus 40 and i'm like i'm just gonna stick this in a snowbank come back for it like an hour later and see how cold it is so it helped (laughs) yep no yeah it will so we meet uh duke leto atreides 
um, who is Paul's dad. Uh, his deal is that he is the Duke of House Atreides, and uh, he is he has a Benny Jesuit uh, concubine uh, named Jessica, who is uh, Paul's mom. Is it, it, I, we say concubine, but she's also like the only woman in his life, so they're based. They're like pseudo married. They're like it, it. What you'd largely it, like? They they have a very con they have like a firmly established common law relationship. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, the only reason they're not married is so that like uh, Duke, Duke Atreides could like potentially jump up the uh, the old uh, corporate ladder through marriage if he needs to. Uh, although yeah, uh, Jessica is the only woman in his life. So. Yeah, and then we yeah, so we're introduced to him. Also, the Atreides have pugs in this. They don't have pugs yeah, in any like, of the other uh, ones. Th that's that's what I was gonna talk about earlier when you're like, yeah, there's no aliens, and I'm like, like, would we still classify that technically as an alien? The pugs. Well, okay, but like, so they live on a, a different planet, right? Okay, I mean like non-human aliens. So technically, pugs whatever. Were, <laughs> technically, pugs wouldn't be uh, native to whatever planet this is, right? So arguably, that that would technically count as an alien. Sorry, uh, I meant like non-human intelligence <laughs> is what I meant when alien. Sorry, I should have been more specific. But yeah, there's pugs in this movie. Is the point of the, the they point cameo of what these pugs? We don't we don't know how how these pugs are defined. Maybe they're telepathic pugs <laughs> maybe i don't know if they're in the book um i'm just glad they're here um and like a kind of sad that they're not in any of the other adaptations it's like oh yeah they have tons of pugs it's 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 kind of funny because it's like one of those uh like bits of like background scenery that kind of just stand out to you because like they're so out of place like they're just something that you really didn't expect to be like in this movie at all and like i think later on they do the same thing with this cat and this mouse that are like taped together in some like weird <laughs> we'll get to that but yeah the pugs are like uh -huh. there's actually like a scene that's awesome where like gurney patrick stewart's character has one tucked into his jacket in like the fights in one of the fight scenes where he's like where he has the dog tucked into his coat and he's just like, we're house of trades with a gun, just like shooting everyone. And it's like really cool. It's like, you've never like some people are like, Oh my God, this is what I want in a man. I, like John Luke Picard with a pug. And that's like every, someone's dream. That's mm -hmm. someone's dream, man. And like, as I was saying earlier, like those could technically be like a, like a, a standing symbol for house of trades at this point in time. Like maybe their banner is just like, a pug on a field of like gold or something i don't know it's not though that. they show their banner and other things and it's like something different uh they show it in the miniseries if nothing else but it's not a pug i, th I, I don't remember what it is, actually but... show it in the the newer one too yeah. uh anyway because of uh the reverend mother who works for the emperor goes to see paul after he has like a vision of the future briefly because he's she's gonna give him uh tests because uh jessica has been training him in the ways of the Bene Gesserit, and she's not supposed to be in fact she was told to marry uh like go she's essentially been assigned to duke leto as her concubine and was told by the Bene Gesserit to bear only daughters and paul is not a girl of any sort so yeah she he did she didn't uh, abide by that um, I actually think that's a really super interesting plot point of like uh, assigning some woman to a man and just like you bear this man only daughters and like okay I think there's something in the book that says like oh yeah the Bene Gesserit can like will uh, things in a certain direction to that I don't remember if that's true or not I maybe heard it somewhere but I'm forgetting but uh, I like this little plot point where it's like that's actually like a huge ask if there's no magic power making this a lesser deal. Cause like, cause like what's the answer that the Bene Gesserit expect of them then her, uh, expect of Jez Jessica then is she just supposed to kill the, or abort the, uh, male children? 
that would have a 50 50 mm -hmm. chance of arising yeah and it also uh goes into how uh like this universe views women yeah um in terms of power yeah um like i kind of in a way i like how it handles is the, is the lineage still passed down? like is the lineage still passed down through males okay. so how it seems to work in like imperial society is like the men are in charge but kind of like in the 19th century sense where like women can still hold some power if they're like uh special noble women um and also there's the Bene Gesserit who is just like this mm -hmm. particularly powerful branch of uh people that have like uh powers that make them politically useful so like it's regimented like it's a regimented society where women can only fulfill certain roles but women are still prominent characters in the book which still makes this pretty good uh, I like how it handles that the women mm -hmm. that the women may be politically sidelined in some sense, but they're not like they, f they are part of the story, which is very uh, honest and realistic based on how this works uh, in a lot of the uh, so, understated ways. Yeah. So in theory, uh, like if house Atreides surviving heir, if Paul was still female, uh, the house would continue on. Um, well, actually, I don't think I don't think that's literal. Uh, actually, that's actually not implied by a text. The implication is that, um, mm -hmm. like, the reason they want Jessica to bear only daughters is so that, um, without a male heir, they're going to be forced to marry her off, and they want to marry her off to the uh, eldest. They would have married her off to the eldest son of uh, uh, House Arcades. Uh, and thus merging these two warring houses. Um, and that was the grand plan of the Bene Gesserit, or part of it anyway. Um, so yeah, no, women cannot hold, uh, okay. like, I think there's, um, some statement somewhere that, uh, they can hold title, but if, I think it's works like technically how it works in, um, like, I think I've said this before, how, um, Queen Elizabeth's husband wasn't king of England. Um, like, cause if, uh, the, that would put the king of England is always in charge. The only reason the queen can be in charge is because there's no, uh, king. And yeah, essentially, uh, her, uh, she, the daughter could inherit the rank of Duke, but if she married someone, that husband would get her rank. Okay. Yeah. So it would have forced, it would have resulted in a merging of the houses, uh, or at least that was the plan. Uh, obviously that didn't happen. Uh, firstly, because I like this, I think this is an interesting implication that like she was told to do one thing and then I guess Paul was conceived male. So she's just like, I can't do anything. And like, why would you like, if she kill? if she would have like, let's say she, um, she does something to, terminate the pregnancy or kill a younger version of paul that could get her in very fucking deep trouble like that could be like murder and treason it's it, it'd be a big double whammy it'd be like in it would be interfere she would be found guilty of interfering with uh the legitimacy of the state and like she could get in a lot of fucking trouble if she got caught doing something to a male heir or a potential male male heir, however it would have yeah, been. Yeah, I definitely uh Yeah. I definitely see that not going over very well. So it's like a very interesting subtext, which like I wouldn't mind like a Jessica prequel novel in a lot of ways. Anyway, Paul is gonna get tested by this Reverend Mother. They have this argument about uh Paul's backstory in Paul's room as he's sleeping, which is kind of terrible. But essentially, Paul's getting tested by the Reverend Mother, and she has him put his hand inside of a box, and then she holds a poison needle to his throat and says, if you remove your hand from that box before I let you, I'll kill you. Um, and this is uh, to, like, demonstrate that um, a, man, a human being can understand that uh, pulling your uh, pulling, like, 
can accept that you're feeling pain for a greater good of survival where an animal cannot. And this is like a test of uh, whether or not, as she put, as the Reverend Mother puts it, whether or not Paul is a man or an an or a human or an animal. Paul eventually passes um, after actually being put through more pain than people are normally put through in this scenario. It's pointed out that uh, any that any time a a boy a male is put through the Benny Gesserit uh, like training, they always die. This may be why. Maybe they're like required to do a little bit more of this. It's also said that they're uh, the first male Benny Gesserit, uh, male with Benny Gesserit powers, who succeeds all the tests, is like the chosen one, the Kisa Tatarak. I don't think I pronounced that quite right, but I was close. So yeah, so he passes, um, and yeah, this is all, and this is all leading up to. Uh, House Atreides taking over the planet Arrakis, a.k.a. Dune, hence the name of the book, uh, which is a big sand planet where they find all the spice, and I've explained what the spice does. And essentially, House Harkonnen had been in charge of it, but the Emperor has taken them, taken it away from them in order for, and has granted it to House Atreides, which is secretly a trap because the movie told us about this, where it was just like something they that... um. It was something that um, in the book and other adaptations that uh, Leto has pointed out because he it points out that our one of our protagonists has some intelligence and it makes them an active part of the plot and keeps us in suspense because we don't know what entirely is going on. But anyway, so yeah, that's a thing. And they get on the spaceship to go to Arrakis. We cut over to meet uh, Duke Carconan who is uh, much grosser in this than in any of the uh, either the book or the other adaptations. Um, in the book, he is mentioned as being a obese man who needs a essentially a booster pack belt to uh, make him float around instead of walking. Or at least he's doing it because he's uh, lazy uh, is another implication. But in this, uh, David Lynch has taken it to add that... Uh, he also has like boils and like rashes and gross stuff all over his face. Um, this is probably one of uh, David Lynch's problem. Uh, the problems with David Lynch's version of this is because uh, he's taken all the negative aspects of uh, Duke Harkonnen and made him goofy. Whereas like in the other materials, he's like sinister and monstrous and clever. In this, he's just like a goofy supervillain. <laughs> Do you know who he actually reminds me of more than probably anything? Who do you think? A uh, fat bastard in uh, Austin Powers. I've never seen the Austin Powers movies. <laughs> if you've never seen the sim like the movies, they're they're very kind of similar in design. I mean, uh... yeah. So yeah, we're introduced to him. He's very gross and cartoon evil instead of like actual cool evil or interest like sinister evil uh we meet his nephews Rebon, who's uh the big dumb lug who's uh hopelessly cruel and then we meet fade who is played by sting and has done very dirty in this movie because um in the other materials he's not a match for duke arconan but is um very much the clever half of this or uh, the clever of the younger two nephews. Uh, they're nephews of Duke Harkonnen. I'm guessing he's not up to creating children for various reasons. But Fade is like this uh, intelligent, uh, scheming character like his uncle. Uh, unlike in this where he's just like favored by uh, du the Duke because he's prettier. Yeah, it's not great that he's being objectified by this uh the duke who is a pedophile in the other versions not so much in this because uh they need to do something way more cartoony by uh having him murder a boy and like bathe in his blood because that's so much more sinister uh the duke mentions that he has a traitor in in house atreides ready to uh help them kill 
guys in House Atreides. Um, in the in the other versions, this is to uh, like make them. This is event. Uh, he is going to eventually make them. He tries to make them. Uh, how you say? Uh, gain confidence as they like get rid of his traps. But that's kind of a subplot that's left out of this version. They got all the people in House Arconan have heart plugs in this, which is a weird, dumb thing that they need to bring in to be dumb. After this, we get our travel sequence. So we're uh, the psychedelic uh, space travel sequence. We're 40 minutes into the movie. Uh, We get a lot. We get more stuff. Uh, We meet uh, Duncan Idaho. Uh, again and he has actually done the first bit of good exposition in this movie in a long fucking time where he uh, explains to uh, Duke Leto that House Harkonnen has graciously underestimated how many of the uh, I suppose like I'll use the term native Fremen but uh, yeah with the caveat that they were there that they immigrated like thousands of years ago but yeah he reports that the Fremen are in way greater numbers than uh, House Harkonnen had figured, and uh, that he's had some contact with them and whatnot. Uh, this is a way bigger plot point than other versions of the source material. In this, it's kind of just left by the wayside. But yeah, that's a thing. They uh, spend the next little bit of the movie finding uh, sabotage devices hidden amongst the uh, palace in Arrakis. Then... Leto and Paul go out to inspect the spice mining operation. Um, we're never quite explained about how that works, but uh, it's done with like uh, sand trawlers, like uh, crossing the the sand and like picking up spice, and are which are like they'll that are frequently attacked by sandworms, but they get away from them by having these massive flying ships just pick up the trawler and like like bring it out of reach of the sandworms. Because that's the only way, because the sandworms will just annihilate the sand trawlers. But anyway, Paul and Leto are going out to go check this out. We're introduced to the concept of the still suit, which is a thing you need to survive on the de- desert planet of Arrakis. It recycles your water. Um, essentially, that's the complicated bit. I like this still suit the best out of any of them. Like, this is one of the better ones. Uh, I like the black color scheme. One critique i do have and none of the ad- this is the other thing none of the adaptations have done right it's pointed out that uh paul has done his uh still suit up in the proper traditional desert style which i can never fucking tell the difference between how he's wearing it and uh how his father's wearing his um or how anyone else is wearing this i wish they do something to make that clear the only thing is that uh Leto requires some help to finish sealing his up. But uh, yeah, no, it doesn't make... They never do this properly. There's some, There's got to be something you could do in the costume department to like make it so that the Fremen and the general uh, Imperial forces wear theirs differently. But they never just... They never yeah. do it. Yeah. And it's, it's just one of those weird things where like they just don't portray that well. Anyway, we're deduced to Dr. Kynes, who uh, works for the Emperor and is... Uh, like an ecologist who's uh, in charge of like maintaining the spice operations on behalf of the emperor. Uh, He's also deep in with the Fremen and has just been here to the point where his eyes has turned blue like the Fremen. Uh, He's actually quite impressed by Paul and notes that he is showing some resemblance to the uh, Fremen legend of the Maudib, who's uh, literally uh, just a, a chosen one prophecy which says uh some an off-worlder will come and he will know your ways like they were his own and he will have the training of a Benny Gesserit which fits Paul perfectly because he's because uh this was a prophecy implanted by the Benny Gesserit uh this is not communicated in this version of the story uh but that is why the uh prophecy exists in the book is because the Bene Gesserit implanted this idea. Uh, Bene Gesserit are also uh, like present in the uh, the Fremen society, although as like a separate church organization that like works in tandem with them. They have their own Reverend Mother and everything. But yeah, 
So, yeah, Paul fits the description of the Maud Deed perfectly. So, uh, yeah, there's already some people suspecting that he might be the uh, Fremen Messiah. Which, yeah, brings up problems, but again, it's also meant to be something you're supposed to be skeptical of. And again, the uh, the Bene Gesserit were, perfectly, uh, were uh, purposely installing this belief in them in order to control them later, which was their inevitable endgame. So there's like an in-universe colonialism that's happened, and it's supposed to be bad. So they go out to check the Sandcrawler. The sand crawler is about to get attacked by a worm, a sand worm. But uh, the carry all that was spo- that w- that's supposed to lift the trawler to safety isn't showing up. So uh, they have to, like, the Duke has to rescue the people uh, in the sand crawler himself, and they do so, which results in and we get to see the sand crawler uh, be swallowed by the sand. And one of the best shots in the movie. It's very impressive. It's just like. This worm the size of, like, an oil rig coming to jump up and, like, eat the oil rig. It's kind of cool. The sandworms are pretty cool. Anyway, that's why they've maintained themselves after for so long. Paul is also getting exposed to the spice out here, so he's getting some visions, or more of his visions that we saw in the early, uh, beginning of the movie. The next scene we get, Paul's in his room, and uh, he gets attacked by a sort of hunter-killer drone that uh, tracks him by movement. Uh, But he manages to catch when uh, one of the servant maids goes and opens the door, getting the killer drone's attention, which he grabs out of midair and drowns in a pot of water. In reward for uh, for saving her, this um, maid tells him that that, uh, there is a traitor in House Atreides somewhere. This is a bigger plot point in other versions of the material where they have more time to deal with. Obviously, we've found out through a uh, a bit of dialogue earlier that Yui is the traitor, and he has been... Uh, essentially, no one suspected him because he's um, a fancy type of doctor that has gone undergone some sort of conditioning that he can literally do no harm. But... Uh, He's essentially been brainwashed in this version of the material. There's a different explanation in other versions, but uh, which makes more sense. But he was brainwashed in this uh, so that he can break his conditioning. So, yeah, that's a thing. I don't know if that was ever actually explained in the uh, they, in the new yeah. version of the movie, though. Um, Maybe they did. In, maybe I missed it. Uh, maybe. I, I just remember in the, uh, in the miniseries and in the book... Uh, the explanation is that, uh, like, the Harkonnen have his wife who is missing and uh, are using that to blackmail mm-hmm. him. And through that, he is able to, like, break his mental conditioning in order to betray uh, House Atreides. It, it's actually brought up m- more that he is, um, there's something wrong, weird with him. Because uh, it's a scene that's kept out of a lot of the movie versions, I think, because it... Uh, or the other versions because it kind of like spoils the later bits. But um, he is uh, Je- uh, like Jessica almost uh, figures out that he's uh, holding something back, but doesn't push it on him because she just thinks he's uh, like grieving over his wife or whatever, which is something that's left out of other versions of the thing, perhaps for the better, actually, because it like puts hit- it kind of reveals the whole game that he's the one. Uh, he's the traitor, whereas without that scene, uh, it's kind of like. There's a few guesses, maybe given this version, uh, maybe Lifso. What was the fucking eyebrow guy? I'm forgetting his name. I'm not looking it up. Um, also, in other versions, it's a big deal. Just that, call him uh, eyebrow guy. I know who you're talking about. I think everybody knows who you're talking about. It's also a big, uh, not so much, a, actually not a bit, really a plot point in this, but in other versions of the story, uh, Jessica is one of the lead suspects of being the traitor which is something gurney points out in uh, other versions a lot more and that's one of his big moments in the other versions of the story but is left out of this one yeah this is that was obviously a misstep they should just let it be a mystery uh anyway uh we move on quickly to the assassination uh the uh, the the defeat of house atreides paul and jessica have been drugged by uh yui because he is their doctor and he has easy access to that. 
Uh, Yui also murdered a housekeeper for ex- murdered the housekeeper for exposing him, and uses that as bait to uh, lure in Lido so that sh- he can poison him with a dart. Uh, this leaves him uh, paralyzed mostly. And when Yui goes to con- uh, confront him, he uh, installs a poison tooth in uh, in Lido in order to get some revenge on uh, fucking Duke Harkonnen because he's not appreciated of appreciative of being brainwashed and also it's maybe an indication that the brainwashing didn't totally work he's not totally loyal to harkonnen he's just they've gotten him to do it begrudgingly so he gives uh leto a poison tooth which will uh which leto can use to try to kill the duke later in the movie a little later in the movie uh in an exchange for doing this he is going to save uh paul and jessica from being murdered by their opponents yeah so the duke ends up in a uh room with the duke are uh, the dukes end up in a room together after uh house atreides has been has been beaten uh duncan idaho is killed uh earlier than he is in the uh regular story yui is killed because uh out of fulfilling a promise to uh duke harkonnen that he'd be reunited with his wife uh, which isn't stated, and it's confusing. It's not uh, done particularly well in this version. Uh, a lot, some of this doesn't necessarily make sense uh, in other versions either. But uh, anyway, uh, the Duke uh, chews on, breaks open the poison capsule, and sprays the poison into one of Duke Harkonnen's assistants, killing him by accident and missing Duke Harkonnen. Uh, in the other versions, it's actually. Uh, the poison tooth is actually way cooler because it fills most of the room with poison. And like Duke Harkonnen has to use his like flying belt to like bring himself into the corner of the room to like get what little fresh air is left in the building or in the room they're in. So he only mm-hmm. barely survives that assassination attempt, which is way cooler, particularly in the 2021 version where like he's just cuddled in the corner of the building and it's like really freaky. So in the meantime, Paul and Jessica are being lured, uh, being taken out into the uh, middle of the desert to be left to die, which is another reason the um, the fucking navigator being in this movie doesn't do anything is because him telling the emperor to kill Paul is ignored because whereas in the source material, uh, the reason they don't kill Paul and Jessica is because... Um, they're under the Bene Gesserit's protection uh, because they are technically Bene Gesserit. So uh, the reason they don't get killed is because of that. And But uh, Harkonnen's doing this little loophole where he's going to leave them in the middle of the desert to die just of exposure. But uh, Yui has left some uh, supplies in the helicopter. Uh, they just need to use their powers to kill the guys controlling the ornithopter is what it's called in other versions it's not so much an ornithopter and this is just a hovercraft yeah they do that they use the voice uh to mind control the people it's basically the jedi mind trick but uh, a little scarier because like you say it and like it's like all distorted like this when you say it so yeah they end up in the middle of the desert uh where they have to flee from some where they eventually end up having to flee from some sandworms where they meet up with fremen who are saying they want to uh they, who debate whether or not they're going to kill somebody uh kill these two for uh their water um it's not so much uh portrayed in this version but uh it's pointed out that in the other versions the fremen uh like absorb all the water from dead bodies so that they can use it later which is why they point out that they're gonna get the water from these people so like essentially you drain the blood and like purify it into water so yeah that's a thing but in this uh but the result of this is still the same paul ends up getting away from them briefly and jessica uses the weirding way to get a hold on the leader of the fremen who we have not seen in this version earlier but is shown earlier in other versions stilgar who is the leader of this fremen tribe and i guess the leader of all of the fremen maybe he's a central figure in the fremen anyway they also cut out a knife fight, which is the ending of the 2021 film. So yeah, this is where the 2021 film ends, essentially. 
But uh, we still have another 50 minutes of movie left. Stilgar agrees to let Paul and Jessica live if they teach uh, the Fremen the weirding way so that they can uh, become more powerful. And this will eventually result in them getting some more power to uh, eventually take on House Arconan, who were uh, very bastardous, bastardy to the uh, uh, Fremen before. So uh, they have no love for the Harkonnens. Although this is very compressed in this version. This is like the last third of the movie. And to contrast, uh, this the last third of this movie is the last two thirds of the book. Just to be clear, like that's uh, just how compressed all this is. We also get some more information that uh, Jessica is pregnant with uh, Duke Leto's daughter. Paul become Paul and Jessica quickly become central to the uh, the Fremen society. Jessica has to uh, replace the Reverend Mo the Reverend Mother for the Fremen because they need to move to evade some uh, Harkonnen attacks and the older Reverend Mother isn't going to survive the thing. They don't even ha uh, hire an elderly Reverend, Rever Reverend Mother in this one. In it's in the book, she's quite an old woman. But in this, she's just like a regular Reverend, regular aged lady. So yeah, they get some... Uh, so that's a thing. Uh, so she's going to replace the Reverend Mother. Uh, in the meantime... Paul gets has to pick a uh, Fremen name, which he chooses to name himself after the a little mouse thing that we do not see in this version. I don't think that uh, it like hops around in the moonlight. It's like a mouse jumping mouse thing, and it's called the Maudib. So he has taken the name of Maudib, uh, which is the biggest uh, jump in logic that happens. But he's also a uh, prophet so a bit of a prophet so because he has visions of the future so that's maybe why he knew how to do that further playing into the uh name uh, the implication that he is the fremen chosen one uh why the fremen have named their chosen one after a random sand mouse is beyond me there is 45 minutes left in the movie so everything is really rushed uh we meet uh paul's love interest uh Shanti, who uh, is very glossed over in this, because again, which isn't, yeah. Oh. So, so I think one of the the biggest public outcries uh, for the uh, twenty twenty one version is the fact that like Zendaya, who's been like amping up the uh, publicity side of this uh, film, was only shown in it for a total of seven minutes, and people are outraged and that everybody's like well if you read the book she she plays such a bigger part in the in the book but like you don't you don't see much of the character in in the uh 1984 version either so i mean like and also like uh her her bit of prominence is like the last two-thirds of the book which uh after is like like they interact after he meets the fremen act uh like joins with the fremen which doesn't happen to the end till the mm -hmm. end of the 2021 movie and is like shoved into like 40 minutes here, like 40 minutes. That's not about her. You get a lot more of her in the mini series and you'll probably get a lot more of her in the uh, second Dune movie when that comes out. But uh, yeah, it's just kind of, but they need to cast her like super early because she's in a bunch of uh, like flash forwards and a bunch of Paul's visions. So yeah. And it'd be wrong to cut her out, cut her out entirely, because uh, especially if you do get into the Dune Messiah stuff, she is a very she is like she is uh, his essentially version of Jessica. Like she is not his legal wife, but she's it's she's uh, the most important woman. We'll get into that a bit more later. Sure. Yeah. Um. So that's a bit of a parallel between him and his father. Anyway. Uh, Rabon Harkonnen is put back into control of Arrakis so that, uh, they can, uh, I don't, in the, in, there's a better, like, clarification for why they're doing this in the, uh, book. Uh, it's not too much portrayed in this version. It's only done so much because, uh, Rabon is the older of the nephews. 
So he is the firstborn. So that's why he's getting this responsibility in this version. But that's beside the point. Jessica goes through the process of becoming a Reverend Mother, which involves drinking this stuff called the uh, Waters of Life, which uh, isn't explained in this version of the movie, so I won't explain it. Also, uh, essentially what she does is it's like a poisonous thing, and like the process she's going through involves her having to change the properties of this poison into something else that gives her access to the knowledge of all the Reverend Mothers. Also, because her unborn child is inside her, that unborn child also has to go through this test. And uh, that results in uh, the child, Alia, who is uh, a freaky little child who uh, talks like an adult and is basically a demon baby. She is called an abomination. I'd like to point out that like the the absolute fucking atrocity of the naming process within this film and this series is complete and entire bullshit because you've got cool characters with like very very abstract foreign fucking names and then you've got characters with literal names of like Jessica and Paul it is weird like yeah. fucking Alea you've got Leto you've got fucking uh i guess Duncan's kind of <laughs> it, it's a cool name, but like different I'm still kind of gonna, cool name. Like classify that as like, yeah, kind of. Well, I I think it's the fact that his last name's Idaho that's really makes it work. But the fact that like his name's Duncan is kind of also. I don't hate the name Duncan, but my point being is like, like get your shit together. It's kind of all over the place. It is sort. Of, it is sort of weird. Then again, like Star Wars does that too. It's like everyone else has a. Although it's just like Luke and Anakin that are weird in that. It's just like everyone else has a weird name, and then there's just like Anakin Skywalker, <laughs> Luke yeah, Skywalker. Like, even, like Anakin, Anakin wasn't like a like a predefined name before that, was it? Like it's still something fairly original. I mean, it sounds weird. It doesn't. It's. I guess Luke's worse. Yeah, Luke is like a basic bitch name. <laughs> is what I'm saying. <laughs> like... Anyway, yeah, it's it's super weird. Actually, I don't know what the explanation for is that Shanti, Shanti, and Paul are already together, so that's very very quickly happens very quickly in this. Paul real gets comes to conclusion that it comes to the conclusion that he has to destroy the spice. Which is uh, not how that happens in the book. I won't get into it too badly because we're been here a while. He, uh, yeah, they teach the uh, the Fremen how to use the uh, weirding modules and the weirding guns. Uh, Paul has to learn how to ride the uh, worm. They get, and then we eventually get into a couple Fremen, a bunch of Fremen raids. They've been out here for two years. That's a bit of short time. Uh, they could have just said it was five years for all we care. Um, Alia grows up into a little girl, but is like it's stated in the novel that she grows sort of fast, but you could also just ignore that and say they've been out of the desert in five years. You could easily have this character played by a five-year-old in theory. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the acting is going to be whatever either way, but whatever. Uh, they find Gurney. He's been operating with some smugglers waiting for an opportunity to get some re revenge on the Harkonnen. So they recruit Gurney back into the uh, fold. The uh, Emperor is not pleased with how uh, Ar Ar Arrakis is going to hell in a handbasket. So he's going to send all his troops to Arrakis. Little different from what happens in the book, but uh, the gist of it's the same. Paul comes to the conclusion that he has to drink the water of life, which is how the Reverend Mothers become Reverend Mothers. We've talked about this. Um... The Pauls observe him, the the sandworms observe him doing this while he does it. Uh, he eventually survives, the first man to ever do so, and he has officially become the super double chosen one. Um, I'm not even really kidding. That sounds like a joke, but it's within the text. At this point, they go to raid the capital. Uh, this, is the, this is the final climax of the book. They ride the sandworms up to the capital. They uh, coincide their rage with a sandstorm, which they let uh, attack, uh, get, let into the capital by blowing up a mountain that is keeping the storm out with an atomic weapon, which uh, is interesting. Um, 
You could have left that out the detail, but it's kind of cool. It, they also call them atomics in this, which is really cool. I like that. In the meantime, um, the Baron, the Emperor, and Reverend Mother, who's the truth sayer to the Emperor, are all in a room together. Uh, this is so the Emperor, and this is essentially their whole thing. They have uh, met with Al Alia, who has shown up as a messenger. Um, in the book, she was captured. In the book and the other adaptations, she is captured. Um, and that's why she ends up in this scene. But they didn't have time to betray that. Uh, because they spent uh, an hour and a half on exposition. Let's just be frank with this. They spent way too much on exposition. Much like we have. But at least I feel like we're like saying something relevant that you didn't like interesting. I hope it's interesting anyway. Sorry if this is boring, guys. I'm doing my best. <laughs> I don't. I don't know how how long we've uh, like we've not necessarily been podcasting, but I don't know if we've had like maybe the Snyder Cut or the Justice Leagues or some of the bigger ones that we've had this discussion on. But like eventually, it's kind of like this. I don't think this is going to come out as long as BVS. Just uh, in total length. But uh, yeah, well, that's fair. I'm almost done too, so. Like I said, we were like once you get through like the exposition and like we we talked a lot about other shit too. So I feel like we went through a bunch of stuff. Well, you need to like oh yeah. Like if we we just came here and explained the plot to you for like forty five minutes, you'd be fucking out of here. You'd have closed you whatever podcasting app you you used. You would have probably uh, deleted the download, <laughs> uninstalled the app, and then just to, like quit podcast or listening to podcasts for the rest of your life. Uh, this movie is very long, very unnecessarily long. Yeah, <laughs> I feel even the 21, 2021 one could have been shorter. But anyway, and you watched the longer version of this somehow. So, <laughs> although I did, <laughs> I did also find this on you. I, I, I watched like a one with Spanish dubs, or like not dub, uh, subtitles. Oh god, that's a... subtitles, Th subs. Yeah, no. Uh, I think I think I started one. On kids is like I'm. I'm not going out of my way. I think it was on Crave though. I think it it came with a Crave, uh, Crave subscription. But uh, I currently don't have Crave because uh, John Oliver is off season, uh, and I don't know what else is on Crave to really watch. So uh, oh, what I didn't. I forgot to check Crave. I just watched. I found it on YouTube. YouTube. Whatever. Moving yeah, on. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, Alia's in the room. The Reverend Mother says that she's an abomination, which, to be fair, um, she is a spooky demon child. Uh, <laughs> there, there is the fact that is just the fact that it matter. She is a very spooky demon child. This is true in the uh, miniseries too, where it's like, oh, this child is scary, and I'm like, I agree with you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, so. This uh, through a bunch of talking, they get it gets revealed that Paul is the Muadib they've been hearing all about. They thought Paul and Jessica had been dead for a long time, but uh, at this point, the final climax breaks out. The Fremen ride in on sandworms and annihilate uh, and with their exploding sound guns and just anni annihilate the uh, Emperor's Sarakar forces because they portrayed they got a uh, hold of one hell of an ambush alia uh, the baron tries to grab onto alia but uh alia manages to kill him with a uh poison needle which she has for some reason <laughs> it's kind of scary that they gave this demon child a uh poison needle although all the reverend brothers are supposed to have one apparently oh this demon child didn't just like make the uh reverend mother's head explode or something fucking weird a shit like that no the, like, I, no if you recall the reverend mother survives <laughs> all this actually uh okay but like what i'm saying is like you built up this like spooky fucking child and then you're just like yeah and then they stab her with a poison needle like you know well i mean she doesn't do anything yeah. really cool well okay. yeah she kills yeah she kills the baron uh, this is way more over the top than it needs to be. She like gets she fought, uh, the Baron gets poisoned, flies out a window, and then gets swallowed by a sandworm somehow. Um, in the book, he just dies of poison uh, because it's pointed out that this is the same type of needle that uh, was held to Paul's throat earlier that would have killed him instantly. So 
yeah, that's just something they've added up to be silly. Alia then wanders off to go stab dead bodies. That is what happens in the book. <laughs> Not some, It's only implied in this version. So, yeah. <laughs> you say it like that, but like... I'm like, if there's there's one hobby like a little demon child is going to have, I guess that's probably going to be it. So, yeah, they uh, managed to get back into uh, the uh, Fremen have won the day and have reclaimed the pug. So, yippee. So Paul's whole entourage strolls into the throne room. The truth sayer tries to use the voice on him and he just pushes her back with his voice. Because he has become more powerful than she can possibly imagine. Paul has to fight Paid, uh, Fade Harkonnen, because he's the last remaining uh, Harkonnen. And uh, they're going to fight to the death. And the Fade is essentially functioning as the Emperor's champion. So Paul and Fade end up fighting. It's a very lame knife fight in this version. I prefer the miniseries version a lot better. I've just talked. The miniseries actually isn't all that good. But it's just so much better than this. Um, so they have mm -hmm. the knife fight. Paul manages to kill pl kill Sting uh, and gets his revenge, uh, sort of revenge. Um, although they've always been revenged. Uh, Faye doesn't actually do anything to the House Atreides in either you know, any version like, up to this moment. So, uh, yeah, they uh, he manages to kill Paul, uh, kill Fade. And uses the voice uh, on the body and like shatters the ground beneath them. They bring in some horse shit uh, ending monologue stuff. I don't think they even include. Yeah, no, in the uh, regular version, they don't include the part where uh, Princess Urlan marries Paul, has uh, gets engaged to Paul for political reasons because he's the emperor now. Because he beat up the ch emperor's champion in a knife fight. And. Because essentially, okay, yeah. Wait, what? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Paul's the emperor now because he controls all Is the. Is there spice. some weird incest like plotline that I missed? No, Did I miss out on there for a second. What? Oh, Paul. Who has to marry who? Paul has to marry Princess Urulan, uh, the emperor's daughter. Which one was the crazy demon child? Alia. Okay, so just similar names. No. Alia ends up marrying a clone of Duncan Idaho in the sequels. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Seriously, apparently. That's not fucking weird at all. Um, yeah. Although she's, that's like 20 years from now. Yeah, but that doesn't make it better. It just make, it makes it weirder. Like, this guy's got to be like 60 at this point, and this, this, this girl's under like maybe. No, it's a clone. 23. It's a clone of Dunk on, I Dunk on Idaho, to be fair. Um, so the yeah, clone that still. Doesn't make yeah. it better. <laughs> yeah. He is. Yeah. The, the Dunk on Idaho. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what. It makes it a little less rapey, but just like a little more confusing. Well, no, they so, fall in love you know. uh, through the course of the movie. Or the the book. I don't know. Moving on. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, Paul's emperor now because he controls the spice and the spice controls who you controls the spice controls everything. And he causes it to rain on Arrakis, which is a uh, not something that happens in this book. Or even something Paul does. I think that's something also, his son, he, son does eventually. Did he get like super preachy by the end of the fucking uh, like uh he gives a speech and he's like, I am the voice of God or something. And then he like makes it rain. Uh, I think that's cut out of the shorter version, but uh, he does make it rain. Okay. Well, literally, it, it, it was definitely in the long version. Yeah, no, that's I guess that's one of the differences. But yeah, the that's how the movie ends. Uh, Paul's the emperor. He's uh, made it rain. And all he just says, he is the Kisa at Tadarak. So, yeah, that's how it ends. Like I said, this is the most uh, weirdly, this is the worst of the adaptations. I don't, again, I'm leaving like kind of the 2021 out of that count because it's uh, not done yet um, in a way. So do you think it's going to be done? I don't know. I, I don't know if they're going to do a set of what all they're going to do in the second one. We'll see. It's hard to tell. Mm -hmm. did, did the new one do good in the money department? 
I uh, I think so. Yeah. Uh, I think. The, but my problem with that is like, is it one of those? Uh, it's got like eighty three on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh oh. Um. um hold on. And. Okay, so box office on it was three hundred ninety three million. Uh, that's pandemic money though, so that's also. I think it's doubled right. at least it. Uh, budget, budget, budget. Yeah, no, it it made its money. Uh, yeah, no, um, hundred sixty five million dollar budget and three hundred ninety eight million dollars at the box office, so that's um, seventy million over. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Doom Part Two was confirmed with a planned release in October, uh, twenty twenty three. They're filming it it's, uh, like yeah. a year from now, I guess. Yeah, they're filming it in July, I think. Uh, Although Dune 2021 mm -hmm. did get delayed like twice. Anyway, so yeah, that's the end of the movie. Closing thoughts. I think we've talked about it pretty well about everything. Yeah, uh, I've got <laughs> yeah, quite a bit to say here before we give scores, which is yep, something that we... I think completely and entirely did not do last time. Yeah, so no, we weird. didn't. <laughs> yeah, we forgot. This... I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. This is something new that I haven't already uh, kind of, like, said earlier. Is like, I don't... One of the, the driving forces behind uh, the, the movie adaptation of the, the, the movie Dune was to... Um, to be a contender of Star Wars. And the problem with that is, like, Star Wars was already so well established. Like, how do you contend with that? Too? Especially as, like, a a pop culture phenomenon. The phenomenon. Phenomenon. I think the phenom... Yeah, okay. <laughs> that word. Like, how do you... <laughs> how do you even... um? like contend with that at that point in time like in 1984 uh of course this failed all expectations like it, it was almost set up for failure in terms of a lot of things like you you had a predecessor that never got made but was like showing very good promise of being a good contender towards uh um star wars and this kind of just fell flat of um really anything and like do I think there will ever be a good adaptation of Dune? I think it, the only way to do it is to flip formats. You cannot be trying to make, like, Dune an action series, first of all. It's not going to work. There's too much exposition. It, 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 it's too bottom-heavy that the only good way to potentially do it is to break it up and put it in to uh probably a television format and like you you've started on this mini series thing and like apparently that wasn't good either but like like modern day like game of thrones was had kind of all the similarities and aspects of the what this has um between houses and stuff like that that people can follow that but you need to do it in a way that it's easily watchable and easily rewindable. If I were yeah. to pay money to go watch this in, fi in film, I'd be very disappointed walking out at the end of it because it, you're not going to absorb as much in information because you can't pause or rewind or rewatch anything at the movies. Um, so you have to pay attention to it and it's boring. Yeah, here's what I think is the core of the issue. I think it's... Uh... In one of the reviews I read from uh, SF Debris, it said, Dune is Shakespeare. Like, it's a political drama about, mm -hmm. like, the fall of this. It's like a Julius Caesar type thing. Where, in the difficulty of that, doing that in the science fiction format, is you gotta learn all these new names. Although, I think there is some, um, like, it uses dukes, so you get kind of the power structure going on. I think that's uh, that's a difficult thing to pull off in science fiction because you have to learn all of these things. Although Game of Thrones did do it well, probably the way to go. It's definitely the way where you're not going to be conceivably rushed to get everything out there, um, where you can like introduce one thing at a time, which this movie just is not 
cool with doing at all. And they try mm. to explain and they in a way trying to explain something too much is the same as like not explaining it at all because you just say so many things and they get and you lose track. I think the key is just like say like go in your writer's room and like figure out the bare minimum you need to say. And like David Lynch and this is just it isn't like a slight against the guy. He doesn't know how to do that. And most people don't know how to do that. It's just a fact of life. Like fantasy writers are a niche genre who have like a very particular set of skills when they do it well. And not everyone has them. And it's very easy to screw up. And and a lot of people want to do it and fall into the pit sometimes. So I, yeah, I think the slower format is better. Um, I don't like how the new movie just ended at like, not a very important part of the or not a very big height of tension like the movie mm -hmm. ends when they join the tribe why wouldn't you end the movie when the house uh uh atreides fell like cut 30 minutes cut the last 20 minutes out of the movie or whatever and just have like the end of the movie being uh like be a cliffhanger and just have Paul and Jessica wander out of the ornithopter after Hulse Atreides get filled and just have that be the first thir third of the movie because that's the first third of the book too. This has already been properly divided. I ultimately think, think um, well, okay, so first of all, I don't like where they ended. Uh, I don't like where they ended the first or the new film ad adaptation. I don't think you're going to make it better by retroactively cutting a film somewhere else no i mean you need to like like reshoot this and like plan for it to end there i think that's like first of all you, like mm -hmm. you can't just like you, you realistically most of the time you can't just cut like 30 minutes out of a movie but I think, there wasn't yeah. the, the, the problem with that there is also there was no build up to the fall of house like there was no like like duncan idaho falling there is kind of like your big central piece of that that uh, yeah. beginning opening storyline is this, this uh, warrior who's supposed to be heralded as something special dies, um, but like that's not exactly like I have no like emotional attachment to this character that they've maybe had on screen for a total of ten minutes. So I mean like. Uh, Duke Leto, same thing. I don't have any emotional uh, uh, connection with the care of the character because the like a lot of the movie is so, uh, so bottom heavy. Like you don't get that kind of like feeling towards a lot of the characters um, that I would have liked to see, especially in like a two or three hour movie where the, it, it kind of feels undershot almost, like to the point of like. Once again, that that's why I have such a big problem with the the character of Paul is because like how how am I supposed to feel about this character that on top of like um having like exceptional plot armor like who can't do anything wrong within in the series has no f failings within the in the movie how can I feel anything towards somebody who's literally just there to kind of drive the story forward to its uh untimely and ultimately disappointing conclusion right oh here's an idea here's kind of what i i think would be interesting uh have like a diff a part each uh like part of the movie which the movie's uh the uh, like dune's kind of three parts it's like the up to the fall of house atreides that uh do uh, paul getting integrated into the trot into the fremen and then f uh them building up toward uh the raid of uh the capital of arrakis what if you told each of those stories through the point of view of the most significant woman in that part of the story like you do um the fall of house of arrakis from largely jessica's point of view because a lot of the interesting stuff's revolving around her in that part of the movie do the like integration of Paul into the Fremen uh, from Shanti's point of view, because uh, she's falling in love with Paul in that. And that's like what needs to happen in that part. And then the third part you do from Princess Arulan, bring it back to the beginning when she did the uh, intro dialogue and just have her observe uh, this mysterious Muad'Dib figure 
like brute like coming on coming upward mostly off screen to go come for the thing that holds the entire power of the emperor empire behind it and like tell it like keep it from the uh, most interesting debatably some of the most interesting characters in the story which are some of the female characters and Jessica is probably one of my favorite characters in this is because she has so much potential but they just like I think you do a lot of favors by like taking the story away from Paul to some extent I think that would do some yeah things. but like uh, but once again like it's it's one of those things where like uh like Paul kind of has an interesting story but he's not an interesting character exactly so that's why I think you take the point of view away from him and so a, a story a, but a story about a sort of interesting story is kind of like I I think you've got this weird telephone effect going on that might affect eventually it, like how how the story's told yeah. in, in this variation at, I, at least in my opinion I think um, this is, okay here's here's my uh, thinking the the Frank Herbert's goal is to portray that uh that Paul is dangerous Paul is going to lead to the uh, big holy jihad where the Fremen will go out, where he'll lead the Fremen throughout the universe and like kill billions of people. Why don't you portray him as like the rise of this movie monster where like, a, like even have like stuff happen off screen or like with him not there and just like see the effects and like, you don't see any of Paul's visions. You just see this guy like staring into the distance with like stuff happening with like his eyes going back in his head and you see like, implications like what is going on with him just like view this terrifying power just steadily get, gaining influence and skill until he eventually just like takes over the entire emperor empire so 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 i i see i see what you're trying to say about the uh both the like the the power dynamics of the, like who this character is but once again, I think that's overshadowed so much by the the the, the uh, actual like character of Paul because like uh, honestly he he's he's always like yeah I'm the chosen one he's never like I'm the chosen one but I don't want to be the chosen one like there's there's yeah no, especially like, he's this. so readily even like even like once again I'd like to bring back uh, the fact of Game of Thrones. One of the key pieces in that, like, first season of Game of Thrones was um, the character of Robert Baratheon, who won the throne through a rebellion, kind of like this, but Robert Baratheon wasn't a good king, he wasn't a good ruler. They could have hard depended on that to push the story forward if we ever got past so so uh, so forth but like i don't know where this movie um rightfully ends and where the books rightfully begin sort of thing like i don't yeah. know how far the story wants to go into to paul's story like 20 30 years down the line or 10 15 years down the line or not mm -hmm. that's not something that i've looked into it's also like one of those things where like your adaptations have been failing i don't know where to go from that once again, as I said earlier, I don't know if there will ever be a good Dune movie because I don't fully understand the story behind it, what Frank Herbert's trying to say. And if what he's trying to say is like, oh, be weary of charismatic leaders because they're going to be short-sighted and downfall. Like, even like Daenerys Targaryen in, in Game of Thrones has that, that looming... She's so charismatic, but she has that looming threat of um, madness behind the Daenerys or the Targaryen bloodline that kind of changed the way that we look at her character so much. Paul doesn't have that. And like I said, a lot of the bad stuff that, like the really indefensible stuff that Paul does happens in the next book, which is a problem for this. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, what has he done in this book? He's overthrown the corrupt emperor who's a bad guy, gotten rid of the Harkonnens, who were bad guys. It's like, yeah, he hasn't done anything, like, that, like, maybe shouldn't have been done either way. 
like him taking the throne is questionable, but that's not like something that most members of the audience are going to question, especially like, yeah, it's just like, we're not like, uh, not everyone's programmed with us, like such deep mistrust of authority that like makes the script work in the end of the day or what the script relies upon on the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And like, as I was saying earlier, like if you've never seen or read the books, like, are you going to walk out with that overall sense of what Frank Herbert is trying to portray in his books. No. And like, once again, that's a more so like just coming from somebody who's only seen bad adaptations and an adaptation is that hasn't been finished yet. I'm very skeptical of where this series is going to go and whether or not it's going to fully pull off the uh, intention that Frank Herbert had when he wrote the original novel of Dune which I also don't know what the original <laughs> intentions of Dune were because I never read the books. So, and I probably won't at this point because like, I don't have that type of time in my life currently. <laughs> I think we've, we should call it. It's been a while. Uh, what do you give the movie Cody? Yeah, I want to, I'm going to give them they're like, okay. So <laughs> here's my problem. I love, uh, early 1980s sci-fi. Yep. <laughs> um, I like the sci-fi effect. I like the uh, general feel of the adaptation, but I don't enjoy Dune. <laughs> like, like, I don't know what to tell you, so I'm not going to rate this very high. I'm going to say about, like, maybe a one to one and a half to two percent on a scale of one to ten. Yeah, I'm giving it a two. Like, I, I maybe talked up a little. Sure. I, like, I, maybe not to come across, but I did not like enjoy this like i got really <laughs> frustrated when i was like there's two-thirds of the book left and there's only 40 minutes left in the movie like it's like this is like way mm -hmm. too much like important stuff that gets like shoved into the last little bit of the movie so i i i, I didn't care for a lot of it and i think I th and once again i think a lot of my problems that i have with both the the older version and the newer version is definitely a pacing problem like you know there's no good way to get past the exposition that you need to do but there's no good way keeping the movie short enough to be viewable and also enjoyable yeah and it just it's not possible like you need to cut that in half or spread it out and there's no good way of doing that um, also, I didn't find it super exciting. Um, there wasn't enough explosions or gunfights or <laughs> or sword fights, which they cut out for fucking knife fights. <laughs> and the gunfights no. weren't very... Yeah, and the fights weren't very good. Like, it's very much CGI. Yeah, it's like green screen. Oh, we're going to shoot at people. It's not like a fight scene. Mm -hmm. Or like green screen, I'm on a giant worm. Yeah, shooting at people, and it means... Which winning. was kind of cool. Yeah, but just not terribly exciting, but... I, th I think one of my favorite shots, though, if we're going to get into this topic, uh, one of my favorite shots, besides the pug shot, which was awesome, um, I think one of my favorite shots was uh, when they're getting attacked by the worm, and they're, like, stuck in a cavern. The cavern outside is all green screen. And then, like, uh, Paul falls down, like, this makeshift. It's meant to be, like, a, a piece of log or something, but it totally just looks like a slide. So that was kind of cool, but also kind of underwhelming and also very, like, 1984's filmmaking. So, anyway, like, yeah. Indiana Jones himself to save me or something. <laughs> Except there's no ILM to make the effects really good. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah these, guys aren't, these guys aren't exactly ILM, which isn't the worst thing. But it's just, like, not as good as other scene, like, shows. But, yeah, this has gone on long enough. See you guys next week for, uh, or next, in, next month for True Romance. Three hours. <laughs> yeah, let's see you next month for True Romance. Uh, that probably won't be as long. Bye. <laughs>